This series of 911 calls captures moments of crisis and urgency. From unforgivable crimes to grandma taking on a snake, each will have you on the edge of your seat. A small, quiet, and friendly town with a population of 7,000 people was deeply shaken when an eight-year-old girl was found stabbed to death in her bedroom. Hi, 911, how can I help you? My children are at home alone, and a man just ran out of my house. My older son was in the bathroom, and my daughter started screaming. Okay. And he came out. There was a man inside of my house. I need an officer there. Where, where, where is your house? The man is gone, though. Okay. Uh, they said he ran out, but they're okay. scared. I'm trying. To... Of course. How old are your kids? Twelve and nine. Okay. So actually, you had a break in. Yeah. Okay. Did they, did they see the man? Were they able to they, describe him? They did see him, yes. My daughter is freaking out right now. Okay, what's your own phone number? Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll get somebody out there. I'm going to go ahead and call the house, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. On April 27th, 2013, 12-year-old Isaiah Fowler was at home with his 8-year-old sister, Leela Felder. She was in a room sleeping on the top bunk of her bed. Their father, Barney Fowler, and stepmom, Crystal Walter, were gone attending a Little League game. That afternoon, Isaiah went to the bathroom and that's when he heard his sister scream. Isaiah allegedly saw an intruder running out from the home's back door and then discovered his sister drenched in blood. She had sustained over 20 stab wounds. Isaiah quickly called 911. The parents immediately rushed home right before Leela could be taken to the hospital. Barney lifted her in his arms and could see the numerous wounds dotted across her body. The little bit I saw that nobody else saw, I won't talk about. He lifted her shirt and would later recollect seeing blood seeping out of her chest. I went in and carried my daughter's body out. I was going to take her to the hospital because I felt she's still alive. Young Layla was pronounced dead just six minutes after she arrived at the hospital. In a statement made to the police, Isaiah described the suspect as white or Hispanic male with a muscular build, about six feet tall, wearing a black long sleeved shirt and blue pants. He was also believed to have long gray hair. The gruesome murder of the eight-year-old sparked a massive manhunt in the Rancho Calaveras neighborhood of Valley Springs. Police officers from neighboring areas were also called in to help as authorities hunt down the suspect. Investigators collected fingerprints and DNA from the Fowler home. A handful of knives were discovered in the kitchen, and investigators removed them from the house to conduct forensic testing. They conducted a door-to-door -door sweep of homes in the area and searched storage sheds and horse stables. Divers were called in to search any local lakes and reservoirs. The Calaveras County Sheriff's Office spent more than 2,000 man-hours on the case, collecting evidence, interviewing people, and following up on leads. One neighbor said she spotted the suspect fleeing from the Fowler shortly after the 911 call. She later recanted her statement. During the composite sketch meeting, the witness recanted her previous statements and her identification of the man she saw running away. She also refused to provide a description to the sketch artist so that a composite could be completed. What was an important witness to the investigators was no longer credible. The news was not taken well by members of the community who have been living in fear. I was like, I was hoping they would have much more positive information for us. And I've got little children and I'm going to keep my doors locked and keep them safe. Another resident expressed his disappointment. It's disappointing. Uh, I thought that we were on the right path. It's a setback, but I trust the, uh, the Calaveras County Sheriff. Layla, was known for her sweet smile, generous hugs, and friendly demeanor has hit the community hard. It does not happen to a person you know, much less a child you know. And this cannot happen to a child in your very own class. Part of the school-guided grieving process included classrooms taking turns writing notes to Leela and hanging them on the fence at the entrance to the school. They came in somber groups and attached their notes one by one. One student wrote, Dear Leila, you are a fun person and very smart. I enjoyed being around you every minute. Another student wrote, I know you were in heaven looking down at us but you will always be in my heart. The Fowler family rallied together, donning t-shirts with photographs of Layla's smiling face plastered on the front. I just want to thank the entire community and all of our family and friends for the overwhelming amount of support that you've given my family. It will never be forgotten. They spoke to the media and urged anyone with any information to come forward. 
the small community of valleys gathered together with candles and sang to remember the eight-year-old girl. Isaiah was often at the forefront of these tearful gatherings. During one gathering, he said, I'm not saying goodbye to Layla. I'm saying see you later. There are no goodbyes. There were still no leads and still no clue who the killer was. However, neighbors in Valley Springs said that they feared all along that Layla's brother, not a mystery man the boy described, might be responsible for the girl's stabbing death. Within days, investigators noticed discrepancies between Isaiah's version of events and the evidence. According to investigators, it was evident that Layla had been stabbed to death while in her bunk but had somehow ended up across the floor. There were no bloody footprints indicating that she did not walk there herself. Furthermore, a steak knife was discovered and placed back in the kitchen drawer. This knife blade had been bent and contained traces of human blood. One neighbor said he did not see anybody enter or exit the Fowler home. Nobody came out that door, plain and simple. I got a German wolf, 95 pounds. Every time somebody walks down that street, they start barking. When this all happened, there was no barks, nothing. Isaiah was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. Violent crime was so rare in this community that even law enforcement officers had to stop and think when asked about the last time there was a stranger killing in the area. Isaiah's arrest came as a shock to the community. It was more shock than relief and sadness because it was actually the 12-year-old the, the who had started all this stuff and then people got angry with it and, uh, and then it just blew up. Isaiah firmly denied that he was involved in his sister's murder. His parents rallied around him and said they didn't believe he was guilty. His father, Barney, said, until they have proper evidence to show it's my son, we're standing behind him. During the murder trial, District Attorney Barbara Yook suggested that Isaiah had stabbed his sister to death before cleaning himself up and calling for help almost an hour later. Dr. Robert Lawrence testified that the injuries were mostly to her chest, but she had also suffered other injuries, including abrasions on her back. He described some of the wounds as prod injuries. At least 14 of them had been made by an object that she was poked with. Ultimately, Layla had died from shock and hemorrhaging. Bradley Swanson, assistant lab director of the California State Department of Justice, testified that a drop of blood had been discovered in the kitchen sink. Blood was also found on a door that connected the kitchen to the garage. Isaiah's defense team argued that investigators had botched the initial collection of evidence at the home and that the pathologist had conducted a lousy autopsy. They also argued that prosecutors had ignored the signs of an intruder and that they had rushed to judge Isaiah. In the closing arguments, the defense team said that the prosecution failed to offer a motive for the slaying adding it was unlikely that a 12-year-old boy would have enough criminal sophistication to clean a crime scene so well. In October 2015, the 12-year-old was ultimately found guilty of killing his 8-year-old sister. He was ordered to remain in custody at the OH Close Youth Correctional Facility until he turns 23 years old. The boy's father stormed out of the court when the verdict was read, while other family members shouted in disapproval. Barney Fowler told reporters after the verdict that he still believes his son did not kill his sister. They won, they started showing me, this is what we have, this is what they had. I said, if you have evidence, arrest them. Here he is, but you have to convince me, and they still haven't done that. They manipulated and twisted everything to help benefit them, and there's plenty of proof and facts saying he didn't do it. The California Appellate Court reversed the ruling, saying two of Isaiah Fowler's interviews violated his rights. He didn't get an attorney, and he didn't get his Miranda rights. Instead, he got badgered by law enforcement who can, tried to convince him that they had proof that he had killed a sister when they didn't. The Fowler's family lawyer said that the DNA found on Layla was further proof that Isaiah did not kill his sister. So the DNA that was found on her body did not belong to our client, anyone in his family, any of the law enforcement or first responders or crime scene technicians who were in the house, and no one who was in the federal database. However, Judge Susan Harlan, presiding over Fowler's retrial, reached the same conclusion of guilt as Judge Thomas Smith who oversaw Fowler's first trial. Harlan reiterated her certainty that Fowler is guilty. She said, there's no doubt you took the life of your sister. You did so viciously and used thought and planning. The victim was eight years old and would have expected her big brother to protect her and not take her life. Crystal Fowler, the stepmother of Isaiah and Layla, discusses the family's life since the day Layla was stabbed to death. So what have these last two and a half years been like since uh, he was convicted? Um. For us, it hasn't just been two and a half years, it's been over five years. Because this started 
April 27, 2013, so it hasn't been any different for us. It's just as awful as it was the first two and a half years and been the last two and a half years. Having to get up there today, you kind of said that you were been sleepless and uh, I mean is that yeah. just like pulling this, a scab off of uh... right these moments um, were not something that I ever wished to relive and um, it has been extremely hard for myself and my husband and my family and my other children um, having to go back through all of this again how do you do that I mean it's I have four children at home still we don't really have a choice mm -hmm. and so those guys are what um, wakes us up every day and keeps us moving because what else are we going to do? So. What was it like to hear, I think it was in March or February, that you had prevailed and he was going to have a new trial? Um, I don't think he got a fair shake the first time around. And so when the appeal was overturned and we knew we were coming back to trial, um, it just felt like a step in the right direction. It was absolutely no victory or anything like that. It just felt like we were moving in the right direction. And um, figuring this out for him is ultimately what we need to do to figure it out for Layla, and that's why we're all here. After a father discovers his child's lifeless body in his car, it leads to a complex trial. Was it a case of forgetfulness or a sinister plan? Sorry, I don't know. I don't want to There's a baby on the ground. What's the address? I'm calling 911. Where is and Cumberland, near Cumberland, it looks like the baby is having a seizure. Okay, what was that location, ma'am? Um, we're at the... You said it's the Sitco gas station? Uh, no, it's the Sitco intersection of Aikersville and Park Harrison. Is it Tokyo area? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> okay. He was left in the car. I think the baby's anybody around them? Yeah, his dad, and it was like somebody okay. to get him to CPR. Can you see the baby from where you are? From where you are? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. How does the baby appear to be? He looks like he's about a year and a half old. All right. And can you see him breathing? Uh, I'm not sure. They're doing CPR. Who is doing CPR? One of the parents? Um, uh, looks like he's just Samaritan and he's just Samaritan. Okay, I believe we do have people on the line, okay? But I want to get as much information I can from you. So, he, we don't know if the baby's breathing, correct? I'm sorry? We don't know if the baby's breathing. It's just on your throat, like this. All right, I do hear the officer, okay? If he's requested our ambulance to get started, okay? We have them on the way. Thank you. Thank you. The call came in from a shopping center parking lot roughly seven minutes after the father, 33-year-old Justin Ross Harris, left work at the Home Depot campus. Witnesses said he was hyperventilating and screaming while he pulled his child's lifeless body from the car. But what had led to this horrifying moment? On June 18, 2014, Harris strapped his son, 22-month-old Cooper, into his rear-facing car seat in the back seat. The father then drove from their Marietta, Georgia home to a nearby Chick-fil-A. Afterward, instead of dropping the child off at his daycare minutes from the restaurant, Harris continued to the Home Depot corporate headquarters where he worked. At 9.25 a.m., the 33-year-old parked and left Cooper strapped in his car seat. Later that morning, Harris and some co-workers left to go to lunch. Upon returning at approximately 12.45 that afternoon, the man went to his car and put away some light bulbs he had bought during the lunch break. Harris allegedly didn't notice the child still in the back seat. Sometime after 4 p.m., when the father was driving toward a theater where he was supposed to see a movie, Harris said he noticed his son. Meanwhile, the child's mother, Leanna, was already headed to the daycare where her husband was supposed to have dropped Cooper off. According to witnesses, she immediately presumed the child's father had forgotten him in the car when she found out the baby wasn't there. Investigators believe Cooper died before noon, having endured temperatures exceeding 100 degrees. Harris was arrested on the scene. Then, what had seemed like a terrible mistake turned into something more sinister. In February 2016, Leanna Harris filed for divorce, 
an unexpected move since she had believed the doting father was incapable of intentionally harming their child. A month later, eight new charges were filed against Harris, including two counts of sexual exploitation of children and six of disseminating harmful material to a minor. The trial was scheduled for April 11, 2016, when jury selection began. However, the high-profile nature of the case caused many potential jurors to be biased toward guilt, so the accused lawyers requested a venue change. The judge agreed, and the trial was moved from Cobb County to Brunswick in Glynn County, where it began in October 2016. Prosecutors argued that Harris's behavior was intentional and that he left his son in the car on purpose. They presented evidence that Harris had researched the effects of hot cars on children and even participated in online discussions about how to survive in prison. Jurors were also presented with the heart-wrenching testimony of Cooper's mother, who tearfully recounted her final moments with her son. In his defense, Harris's attorneys argued that the death was a tragic mistake and that Harris had simply forgotten that his son was in the car. They showed that Harris had been under significant stress at work and had become distracted. They argued that the explicit messages with other women were a symptom of Harris's addiction to pornography, not an indication that he had intentionally harmed his son. Prosecutors claimed that in one of the chats held on the morning Cooper was last alive, Harris posted, I love my son and all, but we both need escapes. It sounded like a motive. And after 70 witness testimonies, ultimately the jury agreed. Justin Ross Harris was found guilty of all charges, murder, cruelty to children, sending sexually explicit messages to a minor, and lying to police. He was sentenced to life in prison plus 34 years. He would get credit for the two years already served. As it turned out, the story did not end there. Six years later, the Georgia Supreme Court overturned Harris's murder conviction after it found that some of the evidence presented during the 2016 trial was excessive and unnecessary. This evidence, particularly surrounding Harris's affairs, may have unfairly influenced the jury's decision and created a bias against the accused that went beyond what was relevant to the case. His defense argued that his son's death was an accident rather than intentional. Despite this, the court upheld the sexual crimes charges against Harris, which he did not contest. He will remain in prison for these. His ex-wife said she felt vindicated by the Supreme Court's decision since Cooper's father was wonderful and loving towards the child but a terrible husband. Jane Kowalski contacted 911 to report seeing a child in distress in a moving car but no officers were alerted. The victim was not a child, but was actually Denise Amber Lee, who had been kidnapped from her Florida home on January 17th, 2008. She was later murdered. 911, where's your emergency? Well, I'm on 41 going south, and uh, I'm gonna do a cross street right now. It's at, I'm on Chamberlain, I just crossed Chamberlain, I'm on 41 going south, and I was at a stoplight, and a man pulled up next to me, and there was a child screaming in the car. Not what a happy kind of vehicle was he in? It's a blue Camaro, uh, like Camaro, like uh, in the 90s or early 2000s or something. Okay, it was a baby or? No, it was a child. It was that more than a, old. I, you know what? It's dark, and I and I turned to look at him, and he's a white male, sort of light colored hair, sort of plump. He's behind me now, and I tried to slow down so he could pass me and I could read his license okay, plate. ma'am, don't hang up, okay? I'm, I'm not. Okay. Okay. Where are you now? 41 Okay. I am, um, I'm going to pass across street, and he, I believe he's still behind me. I'm at, uh, Jinx Drive. I'm just crossing it. I'm going very slow, like 35 miles an hour on 41. And he's behind I you? I believe he's behind me. He has not passed me, and he's going slower than I am, which is not right because we're, like, we're holding up traffic and stuff. But I think that he saw me look at him, and I'm not trying to be overdramatic here, but he's going even slower now. And is he pulling over? No, he, something's going on because he's even going even slower now. Okay. But he's right behind me. And I don't know if the kid was, it's, I don't know. What's your name? Okay, my name's Jane. Okay, he's pulling over to the other lane now. Jane. Kowalski, K-O-W, 
A L S K I. And give me your cell phone number in case I lose you. 813 Okay, he's, he's going to turn. 205-4100. Oh, shit. And he okay. he's going to turn left on Toledo Blade. He's turning left right now. Oh. Uh, and it, it, it is, and I, I'm, I'm in the other lane. And, you're going yeah. southbound, and he's turning left on Toledo Blade. <laughs> and, Right, and it's like a blue, I want to say like a Camaro type of car, white male, okay. and there's a kid in the back seat, and, and they kept banging on the window. Went left on Toledo Blade. About how old is this child? Can you I did, I did see the child, I'd say less than 10, definitely not an infant, old enough to bang on the window. Okay, 7 to 10? I, I, I don't know, 5 to 10. Okay, now it's green, and they sh they're in the arrow, green arrows, and he's going now. He's now, turning left on Toledo Blade. Yeah, do you want me to do you want me to turn? Try to follow him, or okay? Does he want her to follow him? Okay, can you turn? Oh, just, oh, he just turned on Toledo Blade. I don't know if I can catch up. There's a bunch of traffic, and I can't get over. Um, oh boy. A child in the car, someplace between five and ten. And it was banging on the window. And screaming. And crying. And screaming. Oh, <laughs> like screaming, screaming, screaming. Okay. And not a happy scream, like, get me out of here, scream. Left on Toledo Blade. And you said it's a blue Camaro? Blue or black, very dark. He's a white male. And uh, I want to say uh, sort of light colored hair, maybe a little in the face, not I, didn't, I don't think obese, but I'm way past there now. For me to go catch him, I don't know if I'd ever be able to go back. I mean, I would never stop okay, him. I'm not going to put have, myself at risk. But. Okay, and I've got your phone number. 813-205-4100. And your first name again? It's Jane Kowalski, K-O-W-A-L-S-K-I. I mean, I hope they weren't just playing around. To me, it sounded like the kid was... Okay. Swiping and panicky, and I don't know, but um, I, I, instead of taking a chance, I just wanted to make sure I called it in. I'd feel terrible if something okay, was Okay, so I'm very glad you did, ma'am. That's exactly what you should do. Okay, can, well, you can, lost him, and thank you now, and we really appreciate you calling us. Okay, can someone follow up with me? I mean, did, or wait, what? hold on, ma'am. Okay. What? Okay, the vehicle turned left on Toledo Blade off of 41 southbound. She is no longer with the vehicle. The vehicle had a white male, white male driver, blue or black Camaro. Male had light hair, and there was a child screaming in the car. So and banging on the window. Okay. And banging on the window. Oh, like flat. Okay. I've got everybody hollering at me, and... I may need you to pull over, so just bear with That's me. That's fine. Oh, okay. I'm, okay. I'm going to just pull over now. Let me get over. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, I'm glad you called in. <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, I don't know if there's a, um, an Amber Alert out or something like that, but. Bear with me. And where are you pulling over? I just pulled over into the Toys R Us. Um, okay, the Town Center Mall? Town Center Mall, yeah. Okay, that's excellent. I'm from Tampa. I'm going down to Fort Myers to visit my sister. I don't even know where I am, actually. But okay. You're going where? I'm going down to Fort Myers to visit okay. my grandmother and my sister. So there's a Chili's there, and there's a yep. Toys R Us. Exactly where you are. Tell me what kind of car you're in. It's a, a silver Mercedes 380 SL. Okay. If you just sit there. And your doors are locked, right? <laughs> oh, No problem. I just, well, I, actually, I hope it's not to be nothing, really. It, but, I mean, I would never. She's pulled over in the Toys R Us parking lot. Do they want contact with her? Okay. Jane, we have your phone number. If we need you, we'll call you back. You'll be yep. on that cell phone number if we need you, right? Absolutely. And don't hesitate. I'll give you whatever information I can give you. Okay. And we really appreciate you calling in. Yeah. Okay. I've both got a hope. Oof. Man, oh, man. Okay. Thanks, um, Jane. All right. Thank Just you. Drive careful. Oh, I shall. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. A loving husband and wife, two beautiful children, and a charming home in Sunrise. 
a family that was torn apart by the brutal murder of devoted mother and wife, Denise Lee. Denise and her husband, Nathan Lee, were only teenagers when they first met. Nathan had described meeting Denise as love at first sight, and the two married in 2006 after they had their first son, Noah. In July 2007, their second child, Adam, was born. Despite their young age, the couple was determined to make their family their number one priority. Denise would stay at home with the kids while Nathan worked hard to support his family. We had two beautiful kids and were just, you know, just living the American dream, Nathan said. Until suddenly one day, the dream was shattered. January 17th, a Thursday, began like any other. Denise was home taking care of their two children, two-year-old Noah and six-month-old Adam, while Nathan was at work. At around lunchtime, Nathan and his wife had a brief conversation about the unusually warm weather and wished each other a good day ahead. Denise had opened the windows for some fresh air. At around 3 p.m., Nathan called Denise again to tell her that he was on his way home from work, but she did not answer or return the call. To his surprise, he tried calling his wife eight more times during the 25-minute drive home. As he pulled into the driveway of their sunrise home, Nathan saw that the windows which Denise said she had opened during their call earlier that day were now closed. Upon entering the home, he realized that Denise's cell phone and keys were on a chair. He noticed that the windows were closed but not latched and that both children were in the same crib, and his heart sank as he discovered that the person who had put the children there was not his loving wife. He contacted 911, and as soon as he alerted authorities made a call to Denise's father, police officer Rick Gioff, a 25-year veteran of the Sheriff's Office of Charlotte County. Within 30 minutes, police on foot, in vehicles, search dogs, and helicopters were on the scene, combing the area for Denise. Officers asked neighbors if anyone had seen anything, not expecting to get any answers, but one neighbor reported something. She told police that at around 2.30 p.m., she saw a white male pull into the Lee's driveway, but when she looked out of her window 10 minutes later, the male and the car were gone. That evening, at around 6.14 p.m., while authorities were still searching for Denise, 911 received a call. It was Denise herself pretending to have a conversation with her kidnapper, trying to keep her conversation casual and attempting to relay as much information as possible to the 911 operator. Denise begged her kidnapper to let her go home to her children. After seven minutes into the call, the kidnapper realized that his phone was missing and the line went dead. Because the phone was a burner, authorities were unable to trace the call. Still, they were able to determine the name of Denise's captor, Michael Lee King, a 36-year-old unemployed plumber who also lived in Northport, not far from the Lees. Investigations revealed that King was on the brink of divorce, had a 12-year-old child, and his home was on the verge of foreclosure. Police managed to track down his address, but by the time they arrived, it was too late. No one was home. Only remnants of what was later discovered to be Denise's brutal rape remained. Disturbing traces of a child's blanket and duct tape with Denise's long brown hair stuck to it were found in the bedroom. Little did the police know at the time that King had driven to his cousin Harold Muxlow's house with his victim lying on the floor of the back seat. He had asked his cousin to borrow a shovel, a can of gas, and a flashlight. Denise, bound in the back seat, was able to free herself and hastily jumped out of the vehicle and screamed for Harold to call 911. When Harold questioned King, asking what was going on, King forced the woman back into the car and sped away. Harold went back inside his home and informed his 17-year-old daughter, Sabrina, of what he had witnessed. Sabrina called 911 to report the ordeal. Seven minutes after Sabrina called 911, a fourth call was made to the police. Jane Kowalski reported that a man in a Camaro matching the description of the kidnapper's vehicle had pulled up next to her at a traffic light. He allegedly forced something down in the back seat, and Jane told police that she thought she heard a child screaming in distress. Jane later said to reporters, after he does that, a hand comes up from the back seat and is slapping on the window as loud as can be. The caller thought that she was witnessing a child abduction, but it was no child, it was Denise. She told police that she tried to get his license plate, but King made an abrupt left turn and sped off towards Northport. The next time his vehicle was seen, it was too late, again. At 9.15 p.m. that same fateful day, a police officer spotted King's green Camaro and pulled him over. The officer saw a muddy shovel lying in the back seat where Denise had been bound only hours before. King was allegedly soaking wet and covered in mud. The phone that Denise had contacted 911 with was found in King's pocket, and the SIM card and battery had been removed. 
the officer immediately arrested King. The following day, Denise's naked body was found buried in a shallow grave in a muddy field only five miles from where Jane Kowalski had reported seeing the killer. Denise had suffered a fatal gunshot to the head, and DNA evidence also proved that he had sexually assaulted her multiple times. It was later discovered that Jane's call was never reported to the police. The operator who took the call claimed she yelled out to the dispatchers to send a patrol unit to the location of the call. The two dispatchers who failed to send officers to the area blamed shift change and a chaotic environment for the mishandling of the call. Both were later suspended without pay. It was especially difficult for Denise's father, who worked at the same police department, to stomach the fact that it was his place of work that was to blame for such a grossly botched call. On January 23rd, King pleaded not guilty to the abduction and murder of Denise Amber Lee. However, Sarasota County prosecutors charged him with the blatant crimes that he committed, and he was sentenced to death. The tragedy of the murder left her family heartbroken, especially her husband and father of their children, Nathan, who said, I was supposed to spend the rest of my life with her, and there wasn't a doubt in my mind, there wasn't a doubt in hers. The best four years of my life, I'm sure, for my whole life, if I was in that situation, I don't know what I would have done, he said. She did everything she could. Denise did everything in her power to save her life. A quick thinking teen called 911 from under her bed while two men walked around the house. 911, where is your emergency? I think there's somebody in my, in my house. I don't know who. Okay, what city or township are you in? Harrison Township. What is your address? Okay, hold on one minute. Yeah, okay, where are you at in the house? I'm in my room upstairs. Are you walking downstairs? I saw someone looking to my door downstairs. 13 year old upstairs. Okay. Did you say upstairs in your bedroom? Yeah. Are you expecting anyone? No. Okay, tell me again what you hear. I don't know, I heard walking downstairs, and when I walked downstairs, someone was looking through the door. And can you describe what this person was? He had like a black hat on, a brown jacket, I think. So you think it was a male? Yeah. <laughs> and you saw a male with a dark hood and a jacket? Hello, don't hang up. Hello, where are you at? Rachel, she saw a male inside. Now she's not answering me. Are you there? No. Okay. Do you have a closet in your room? Okay, they're on their way already. My partner's got them on the way already. I want you to go some... Do you have a lock on your bedroom door? Yeah. They already what? They've are... Where are you, under the bed? Okay. Just lay quiet. I can listen, okay? I'm going to listen. Lay the phone down and I'll listen. Okay. What is your first... What is your first name? Chloe. Yeah. There's two people in the house. They. How do you spell your name, hon? Okay. Okay. So you said they've already been up and through your bedroom. Yeah. Okay. You're still under the bed. I'm almost. You what? I'm like halfway up there. Okay. How did they not see you? Was the house locked that you were aware of? Yeah, they went through the garage door, I think. They came through the garage door? Okay. Do you have a dog? Yeah. Did the dog bark? No. Where is the dog at? I think downstairs. What kind of dog? Uh, the lab. She has a lab. The dog didn't bark. Okay, Chloe, I think they've spotted the guys, but I don't want you to come out of your bedroom, okay? I want you to stay there until I tell you it's safe, all right? The deputies are out there. He's tall. If you were to guess how old he was, would you be able to tell me? Please. Pardon me? Like, uh, like 20 to 30. 20 to 30 is white male? Yeah. Think really hard. Did you see any gloves on their hands? Yes, I think so. I think black gloves. Black gloves? You still under your bed? Yeah. All right. Someone was knocking on the door okay. before this happened, and I looked outside, and they had, like, a black van. A black van? 
Yeah, it was like a dark color. It's not like it was like a dark colored van. Okay, is it possible for you to look out the window and tell me if that van is still there? Oh no, I already looked out when we were walking around downstairs. Okay, so the van was gone. Yeah. Okay, and you said it was a dark color van. Yeah. So do you think they were dropped off and then the van pulled away? Okay. Uh, then this happened. Okay, hold on one moment. Can I get the air? Uh, you know, on Hammond, the caller believes that these two suspects were dropped off by a dark colored van. It pulled away, and then she heard the subjects inside the house. Did the van have windows? Yeah. A lot. Okay. She also states that it has lots of windows. They knocked on her door first. Well, you're doing a really good job. These officers got a really good description of them. All right. My cat's with me right now. She's under the bed with me. Okay. Okay. I just want you to be safe right now, okay? So I'll let you know when the deputies are coming back to the house. But you're not hearing any more noises downstairs? No. Did you hear any doors slamming any time that you were talking to me? No. Okay. Does it look like it's a Okay, listen, I've got a command officer that's there. I'll tell you in just a moment. I, I do have an officer that's out there at the house. And you may hear him come in and walk around, okay? Okay. Can I get out of the bed? Do I hear him? Once, once, I, once you hear from them, you can get out, yes. But he is definitely at the house. Okay. Okay, he's going to walk up to the door now, okay? Okay. The front door? The front door is locked. Okay. He'll figure that out. I want you to... My partner just told him when he's inside to call your name. Okay. Where are you at, Chloe? Can he see you? I just saw him. He's okay. walking to the next. He's walking next door. Okay. He's running. Chloe, do you have a bathroom downstairs there? Yeah. Okay. I want you to go in that bathroom and lock the door until I tell you. Okay. Was your um garage door open? Oh, there's there's a side door. Okay. On my garage, I see the top. Okay. He's walking in front of my house. Okay. Okay. Do you want me to go get the door? Okay. She's coming to the door. All right. I'll let you go, Chloe. You did very, very good. Very brave. Okay, um, bye-bye. Bye. That Thursday afternoon, it was completely by chance that 13-year-old Chloe Symington was home alone. She had been feeling sick at school and being driven home by her grandmother. Chloe was watching TV in her bedroom when she heard knocking on the front door. I went to my door again and looked down to see a guy looking through the table drawer next to my front door. And that's when I got freaked out. She could see the man from upstairs and called her father's phone to know if he expected someone. But Noel, an engineer at the Norma Group in Auburn Hills, didn't answer because he was in the middle of a presentation. Calls to her mother, Lori, also weren't answered. I was really freaked out, scared. I didn't have time to get underneath my bed because in two to three minutes after that, the guy came upstairs. I was just curled up in a ball right there. Meanwhile, the family's pet Labrador, Roxy, seemingly stayed friendly towards the intruders and didn't bark. During the time, the men stole Christmas gifts, electronics, and a rifle. Chloe remained calm and followed her dad's advice to stay quiet. Well, my dad's always said, like, think now, react, or panic later. So I was just thinking, all right, I need to think of what ifs, like, because that's, like, if they come up here and if they see me, what am I going to do? When the Macomb County Sheriff's Office responded to the call, they saw the two men walking away from the home. One of the suspects was tracked and apprehended by a canine unit, while the other surrendered himself. They were later identified as Daniel Paul Laughlin and Michael Thomas Donkevich both 19 years old. Some of the stolen items were recovered. Laughlin pleaded guilty to charges including home invasion, conspiracy to commit home invasion, felony firearm, and resisting arrest. Considering his prior convictions and participation in adult drug court, he was sentenced to 13 to 30 years in prison. Meanwhile, Zdankevich received a special sentence for youth under the Holmes Youthful Trainee Act. This would lead to the conviction being erased from his record if he complied with the judge's conditions for up to three years. 
At the time of sentencing, he had no priors and was among the top of his graduating class at Clintondale High School. Chloe's dad, Noel Symington, said he couldn't be prouder of his daughter, a straight-A student at Lance Cruz Middle School Central. And Macomb County Sheriff Anthony Wickersham praised Chloe for not confronting the suspects. It was just after 10 p.m. when Alex Murdaugh of the powerhouse legal family of Murdaugh's found his wife and son shot dead in their Colleton County hunting estate and hastily contacted 911 to report their deaths. Yes. 
Okay. I don't want you to touch them at all, okay? No, I don't know if you've already touched them, but I don't want you to touch them just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? I, I already touched them trying to get a, um, to see if they were breathing. Okay. Well, I just don't want you to move anything just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? Ma'am, I'm going to call. I, I need to call some of my family. Okay. Well, well, do me a favor for me. Whenever you see the officer or the medics, because they're, they're all coming to you. Absolutely. Okay. But we have them come and turn on the flashes on your vehicle so they can see you, okay? You got the flashes on for me? I do. Okay. All right. Just whenever you see them. Okay. How old is your son? 22. Okay. All right. We're, we're getting them out there to you, okay? And I will answer if you call. All right. Alex Murda had reportedly returned home to the 1,700-acre estate situated in both Hampton and Colleton counties. He found the body of his wife, Maggie Murda, and his son, Paul, in the garden outside one of the two homes on the estate. The two were reportedly shot execution style. Maggie had suffered multiple wounds from what authorities determined was an assault rifle and Paul the same, but a shotgun had caused his wounds. The double homicide became an item of national interest due to the family's name and mysterious circumstances surrounding the mother and son's deaths and the family's ties with two previous killings. In 2015, 19-year-old Stephen Smith's body was found on Sandy Run Road in the early hours of July 8th. His autopsy revealed that the cause of death was a hit and run and that he had suffered trauma to the head that the side mirror of a vehicle may have caused. Even though the Murdaws were never officially linked to his death or questioned directly by police, the name came up multiple times during Smith's family interviews. According to files on the case, a member of the Murdaugh family and personal injury lawyer had contacted the Smith family and had offered to represent them at no charge. The family allegedly reported this offer to detectives as weird. The case had gone cold until Paul and Maggie's deaths. Then, in 2019, a 19-year-old woman, Mallory Beach, was killed in a boat crash. The driver of the boat was none other than Paul Murdaugh, who had reportedly been intoxicated when he was driving the boat. This was according to surveillance footage taken at the bar he had been at shortly before the crash, as well as footage of him walking to his boat. Officers who arrived on the scene that fateful night failed to administer Paul with a sobriety test, something that was widely criticized by the media. Since Paul and Maggie's death, it was cited as a failure to conduct an appropriate investigation. According to toxicology reports at the hospital showed that Paul had a blood alcohol concentration more than three times the legal limit. However, in court, Paul was not restricted from drinking alcohol or driving a boat even though he faced felony BUI charges. The entire investigation was widely criticized and even more so in the weeks after Paul and Maggie's deaths. The Beach family is suing Alex Murdaugh. Alex Murdaugh and his son, Richard Alexander Murdaugh Jr., also known as Buster, released an official statement promising a $100,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible for the murder of his wife and son. There is much speculation around Alex's involvement in the killings, and some have dubbed him as a person of interest in the case. However, despite any suspicion detectives may have towards the lawyer, no suspect has been arrested, and investigations surrounding the double homicide and two killings before the homicide are still ongoing. Just before 11 a.m. on Saturday, February 24th, 2018, multiple calls came in to 911 about a stabbing at Winchester Public Library in Middlesex. Three of the calls described the bloody scene. This is the library. This is the library. Somebody is stabbing someone. Please come. Hurry. Yeah, yes. Hurry. Yes. Okay. Where are they? Winchester Public Library, main public floor in front of the reference desk. You stabbed a woman in the back. You just stabbed a woman in the back? Yes. Control the 922, 924, 929, respond to the library. Oh, I see the knife. Just stabbed a woman in the library on the line getting further. 
What does he look like? Um, I think they've got him cornered. Listen, what does he look like? I'm trying to. Hello, please. I'm sorry. There's somebody helping her. I, there's somebody cornered with his hands up. He's got a gray sweatshirt. Um, I think Asian, short dark hair. Okay, hold on. White male? No, Asian, I think. The Asian male with the gray shirt on the line getting further. Sorry. Do they have them stopped? I think so, yeah, they're three, two, P5, three, and one to the library. Have him reported the of a party stabbed in the back. He's been disarmed, I think. I'm on the line getting further. That's yeah. engine two, P5, to the Winchester yeah. Public Library for a man with a knife stabbed a party in the back. Is somebody on the way, please? Yeah, I already, you hear me just batching a man. Okay. So it's an Asian male. He no longer has the weapon. I believe so. We're in the library. Um, in front of the reference desk. In the main, it's on the main level. Yeah, if you come in Washington Street. In the reference desk, the man is now disarmed. People have him cornered. Medical's en route as well. What's your name? My name is... I'm Who has them? Desk. Who has them held? Um, I, There's a group of people? It's a group of, of yes, just patrons, not library staff, I don't think. Okay, and where's the woman that was stabbed? Um, she's lying on the front, on the ground in front of the, um, there's a display in the middle of the room. Okay, is she conscious? Um, I don't think so. There's a lot of blood. Um, um, she's lying down on her back. Oh my God, there's a lot of blood. Go, can you go go direct the police? Yes, I can meet them. Will they be carrying in the water? They're, they're already there. Go ahead. They're already there. Okay, yeah, I'm going to hang now. Do uh, you want to stay on the line? Are you on a cordless? No, I'm on a cordless phone. Oh. Hang on, I'll just leave it open and I'll get somebody else to come pick it up. Hang on, I'll be right back. Hello, this is... I'm at the okay. library. Yeah, we already... Do you see the police there? I heard the siren. Okay. We have, a, we have somebody down. Okay, we have the ambulance on the way. Okay. okay. Hold on. Hold on. P5 on location. Is that patient conscious? Um, yes. She is conscious. Tell her that the ambulance is yes. there. They're coming the in. Wanda, is the person with the weapon still in the building? They said that they have them cornered somewhere, no? Um, I'm standing at the phone. Can you ask anyone who, like, if we know what it's... Hold on. Yeah. I'm gonna, all right, I'll let you go. Everybody's already there. Okay. All right. All right. Okay, thank you. 911, your call is recorded. Where's your emergency? Hi, uh, Winchester Public Library. Yep. Hello? Yeah, we need an ambulance and police. Okay. Do you have a description of the person there? Uh, the person who stabbed, yeah. No, the person who did it. Yeah, yeah, he's here. He does stand up. Are we there? He's here, yeah. What's he What's he wearing? He's got a like gray hoodie on. He's kneeling down. Got his hands up. He got his hands up. Yeah. Okay, the police have him now. No, we're just waiting here for the police. No police yet. Okay, and you need an ambulance as well. Yeah, the lady got stabbed. What's your name? Come as soon as you can. Who is it? <laughs> Do you work there? No, I'm just here studying, and this lady got fucking stabbed. What's your callback number? I don't see anyone in here. Where, where, yeah. where, where is the person right now? Uh, he's here. He's like right in the back of the library. In the back of the library, outside the library? No, we're inside the library. Well, stay on the line with me. Okay. Yeah, it's safe in here. Just come in the library. Look, this lady got stabbed. Right, we have people coming in. Okay. One more minute. Stay on the line. Okay, the police should be there now. Are you there? Yeah. Are they there now? They're not here yet. We need someone here. <laughs> I don't know if they're like being cautious at the entrance. No, no, they're, 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 they're going they're, right in. They're here. Okay, and they, you have them inside? Yeah, the cops are here. They're getting the guy. All right, make yourself known uh, to them. And there should be an ambulance here as well. Okay, yeah, I heard it, but I haven't seen it. And the lady's on the ground. And I'm here. Okay, all right, your callback number again. So I got a lot of background. Did you yeah. see it? No, I just heard the girl yell, and then okay. everyone freaked okay. out. So, yeah. All right. Thank you.
Very true. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. The first victim, 22-year-old Deanne Kenny Stryker, was sitting at a table in a reading room near the library's main lobby, studying. The attacker, later identified as 23-year-old Jeffrey Yao, approached her from behind and, unprovoked, began stabbing the woman with a 10-inch hunting knife. As the attack started, people came rushing to help her, including a 77-year-old man who had been seated near her. Yao paused momentarily when the man shouted for him to stop, but then turned to the 77-year-old man and cut him across the top of his arm. The 23-year-old then went back to stabbing Stryker. He continued the attack, even when she attempted to flee to the front lobby. Finally, others in the library managed to pull him away from the victim. Once Yao was unarmed, he put his hands in the air and was taken into custody. Tragically, Stryker was pronounced dead at the hospital. The 22-year-old's autopsy showed she was stabbed 20 times. There was no connection between her and her attacker. A witness described what he saw to WCVB Channel 5 News. It was a, a woman taken out, uh, and uh, I didn't get close to her, but it appeared that she had some injury to the uh, shoulder. The attacker was held without bail on charges of murder and armed assault with intent to murder. It wasn't his first brush with the law, though. In fact, over the last six years, there had been many more incidents. Each incident increased the family's concern for the man's mental health. Starting from February 2012, two students at Winchester High School were worried about Yao's Facebook posts. He had posted a video of a manifesto linked to the Virginia Tech mass shooter and another video of a shooting demonstration. A child psychiatrist cleared Yao to return to school, which he did. In November of the same year, police responded to a report of glass breaking at an elementary school in the early hours of the morning. Although the officer said he had an extensive history with Yao, he was just given a pat down and driven home. Throughout January and February of 2013, reports against the man came in. Police called him a wanderer with mental issues, but nothing was done. By March, Yao's father went to the police himself to ask for help with his son. It's unclear how they responded to the pleas, but a few days later, he was allegedly walking around, peering into driveways and yards, and looking suspicious. Fast forward to November 2013. Yao's father again contacts the police after waking up to his son standing in the hallway of their home with a six-inch stainless steel knife. The concerned parent contacted McLean Hospital, hoping to get him admitted, but they were turned away. The hospital said the family needed an ER evaluation of crisis team intervention. Police took him to Winchester Hospital for an evaluation. The following year, complaints were laid against the attacker, ranging from online bullying to trespassing. In April, Yao reported his bicycle as stolen, but he was found riding it days later. The man told police he had found it in a parking lot. Four years since the first known incident, and exactly two years before the stabbing, a neighbor went to the police station. She was concerned after he had broken her front door's window by throwing a shovel at it. The complainant wanted an intervention because of her young children, who commonly played outside. A month later, the attacker wanted to turn himself in for kicking in a door of his home. He told police he would be released from a mental health hospital the next day and should then be arrested. His mother told authorities there weren't any doors kicked in at his house. Still, no action was taken. In October 2016, Yale went for a mental health evaluation again after a healthcare worker at the same library the stabbing happened at said he had been making suicidal statements. From December that year, up to days before he attacked Stryker, the attacker had three more interactions with police. He claimed his therapist was threatening him, believed chemicals were coming through the house vents that were making him sick, asked a dairy barn customer to do him a favor and kill him, and he crashed a car. Jeffrey Yao's lawyer, J.W. Carney, was asked by Great Boston 
how he could say after all this that there was no way to predict this kind of tragedy. The lawyer even went as far as to praise Winchester police for how they handled the reports. Carney said although the parents and police could have had Yao involuntarily committed, they didn't because the law doesn't permit you to commit someone just for having a mental illness. The attacker had to be a direct threat to either himself or others. In some instances, Yao had made such threats. Prosecutors told the courtroom that even at the time of the attack, Yao was on pretrial probation following his arrest and the previous fall. He had allegedly attempted to break into a neighbor's home. The charges were filed in September 2017, after the neighbor woke up to the 23-year-old banging on his back door. The neighbor referred to the attacker as a total loose cannon to the police. Others in the surrounding area shared the same sentiments. Despite reporting Yao to authorities multiple times, little was done. One of the nearby residents, Leslie Luongo, told the Globe that she knew something would happen, but they didn't know when. She was so frightened of Yao that she would run to her car every day when she left the house at 5 a.m. to go to work. Luongo said residents kept their children indoors, kept baseball bats nearby, and locked their doors. The most alarming part, when she reported her concerns to Winchester police, she was told not to worry. Officers said they were shadowing Yao when he went out that night, but that was not the case. Luongo spoke to reporters shortly after the stabbing. It's a very sad time in our neighborhood. We're mourning this girl. We still feel like we lost one of our own. We went to the police, and now this poor innocent girl, whoever she is, is gone. And they have to do more in this country with mental illness. Went to the police and we said, you know, they go, we're, we're, we're handling it. It's under control. Don't worry about it. You know, we, under, we know what's going on. We can take care of this. Concerning the September charges, the 23-year-old was required to remain mentally compliant, which reports said she was. However, his attorney, J.W. Carney Jr., blamed his client's long history of serious mental illness for the unprovoked attack. Carney said, this is the type of episode or illness that really can't be predicted. It's totally unexpected to everyone, most especially his parents. This statement was a stark contrast to what those who knew Yao said. Community members left flowers at the library as the victim's family asked for privacy. Meanwhile, Hundreds gathered at the Winchester Unitarian Society to remember 22-year-old Deanne Kenny Stryker. She was a first-year student at the University of New England's College of Osteopathic Medicine. Friends remembered her as a young woman who was committed to helping others. Deanne was such a nice person, and it's not fair what happened. It doesn't make sense. And we hope she's remembered for everything that she has done and that her memory lives on and everybody cherishes the moments they had with her. She had hopes of working as a physician. As a teen, Stryker had worked caring for children. A family friend said his daughters grew up with her. We've all known them very well for a long time, and they're just a, an extremely nice family, a remarkable family, and their mom uh, obviously is uh, struggling to make sense of all this. Deanne is a, a special kid. She's overcome you know, some real obstacles in her life, and she decided early on that she wanted to be a doctor. Um, she studied at Northeastern University four years ago. And so the mom has raised the three girls um, mostly on her own. And everybody was just so proud of, proud of her. She was just a, a remarkable kid. The 77-year-old man who was stabbed while trying to save Stryker was later identified as Lester Tabor. He was treated and released from an area hospital. He said, it's a tragic situation. I've expressed my condolences to the family of the young girl. A not guilty plea was entered on Yao's behalf, and the judge scheduled a probable cause hearing for April 11th. The killer's defense entered an insanity plea, saying there was approximately two hours of evidence to back this up. The prosecution disagreed. In the weeks and months preceding the murder of Deanne Stryker, the defendant took a knife fighting class bought the knife he used to kill Ms. Stryker in the days before, 
and searched many times on his computer about how to slash someone's neck. However, medical experts said Yao was mentally ill then and now. The judge asked the accused about it. I understand uh, from uh, exhibits that are being admitted in this case, which I have reviewed, and from Dr. Edersheim's testimony this morning, that you have a psychiatric diagnosis. Can you tell me what that is, please? Schizophrenia, Your Honor. He said he thought the victim was one of the voices in his head. In March 2021, he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Three experts found he didn't have the capacity to understand his actions. I find that Mr. Yao is mentally ill, that he is not a proper subject for commitment to any facility of the department, and that failure to retain Mr. Yao in strict custody would create a likelihood of serious harm. Accordingly, I will allow the Commonwealth's petition for commitment to the Bridgewater State Hospital. There was no injury in the case. The following story deals with sexual assault. Please be advised. A young student's safe haven soon became her prison when she was woken up by a stranger in her apartment, suffocating her before proceeding to sexually assault her, an ordeal that lasted for two hours. On the morning of May 12, 2006, Kimberly Corbin's life was irrevocably changed when a stranger broke into her college area apartment and assaulted her. Corbin immediately dialed 911 soon after her attacker fled. Hello, 911. Hello? Do you need help? Where are you? Hold on one second. I can't hear you. Okay, say it again. I, I can't hear you, dear. Can you speak up just a tad bit louder? Say it again. I'm going to listen very hard. 701? 77? 1707? Okay, hold on one second. I need somebody to pull my channel. Thank you. That's okay. I understand you're having a hard time. Say it again, okay? I'm, I'm trying to hear you. 717? 707? Okay, 707, what street? 707 29th Street? I don't know my address. You don't know your address? Okay. Are you calling me from. Oh my God. Try to say the address, okay? <laughs> What's going on? Address. Okay. What's okay. The address? <laughs> We're on 47th Ave and, and 34 Bypass and the apartment. 47th Avenue and the 34 Bypass in the apartment? Yes. Yeah, okay, what's right. going on? I was right. <laughs> You were what? I was right. Okay. Did the person that did this to you, are they still there? <laughs> just left my <laughs> Okay. Who, what, he just left? Yes. He's about, I think he's like five, eight, five, nine, about a hundred. Is he black, white, or Hispanic? He's white. He's about 160 pounds. He's wearing glasses, white tennis shoes on, and a black shirt. <laughs> Black shirt and jeans? I don't I didn't use okay. white tennis shoes. And white tennis shoes? Yeah. He just took off? Do you yeah. know this now? What? Do you know him? No, he knows my roommate. Corbin was a typical college girl at the University of Northern Colorado, majoring in business. She and two of her friends had just started renting an apartment in West Greeley. So after finals, we were able to get everything in there and situated in my room just the way I liked it. At 5 a.m., she was woken up from a deep sleep with pillows shoved in her face, suffocating her and a stranger telling her to shut up. Corbin said she had no eyesight and no idea where she was. 
She recalled the events in an interview with Nine News. I went to bed around 1 o'clock, 1.30, somewhere in there. Um, and the next thing I remember was waking up and feeling like I was suffocating. It was really hot, and I tried to sit up right away because I was startled, and I hear someone saying, you know, shut up. Fearing for her life and not knowing if her attacker had a dangerous weapon with him, she decided to be submissive in hopes of sparing her life. Corbin also feared that the assailant would go after her other roommate, too. After an hour, he got off her and started a conversation, trying to assuage his guilt. She used that time as well to get to know her attacker. Corbin remembered an article about a rape survivor who had engaged her attacker in a small talk to avoid being killed. She tried the same tactic, hoping to gather information. I didn't panic. I didn't do anything. I just laid there and listened and locked every single piece away in my brain. For an hour, they talked about what he had done. Corbin told the assailant not to worry about it and that everyone makes mistakes. She memorized her attacker's whispered taunts and gauged how tall he was, his weight, even his shoes. A few weeks after the incident, the police working on this case asked Corbin to listen to a taped conversation with a man they had arrested for taking pictures of women's buttocks at a Greeley apartment complex. When she heard the voice, she knew exactly who it was. She learned that 25-year-old Ronnie Pieros had stalked her and her roommate for a week. He had entered through an open window. Pieros also had a video camera with him when he attacked her. From victim to advocate, Corbin has traveled across the country speaking to victims of sexual assault and raising awareness about rape and its impact on its victims. She has taken back her power and now shares her story, empowering survivors and preventing sexual assault. Corbin got a measure of retribution when a Weld County jury found Pieros guilty of sexual assault. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. You know, I have this creep sitting five feet away from me, but I was absolutely in the zone, like knowing that what I'm doing here is protecting so many other people. Like, this is not just about me anymore. Pieros was sentenced to 24 years to life in prison for his attack on Corbin. But my efforts were not only for my own safety. They were for, every, for the safety of every woman you see today here in court, every woman in our community, and even for every woman in your life, Your Honor. Eighteen-year-old Daheem Williams had visited Shamrock Deli on the Houston Township side of Cuthbert multiple times to ask the owner, Jerry Pastore, for a job. On January 3, 2020, at around 4.50 p.m., the encounter did not go as usual. Williams grabbed the tip jar off the counter and fled on an orange bicycle. Pastore followed closely behind. Minutes later, this 911 call was made. 911, where is your emergency? Yes, I, I, someone just got stabbed in the neck at the... No, no. You know who did it or no? No, I don't got concussion blood. No! All right, I'm calling 911 right now. Did yeah, you get a description of the person who did it or no? Yeah, it's a black guy. He's covered his neck. He's stabbed in the neck bed, man. I need an ambulance. No, I already got him this past day. I'm saying, did you see the person that did it? Yes or no? Just stay with me, Joe. Stay with me. Sir. Stay with me. What? I'm holding his neck, dude. Joe, are you with me? Joe, are you with me? Sir. Sir, are you with me? Can, you get, can, can anyone get a clean towel or cloth to apply I'm pressure where he's bleeding I'm from? I'm All right. Neck. Is the person who stabbed him there, yes or no? No, he's gone. He ran. Did you get a description yeah. of him or no? Uh, yeah, he's a black guy wearing a black coat, riding an orange bicycle. He's stabbed in the okay. neck. Here, take my phone, call 911. Talk to 911. Come here. My phone, take my neck. Sir, they're all, helps on the way out there, there, okay? Just apply pressure, okay? Just right keep here. applying pressure. So on, 911's on there. Hello, hello. 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 Tell him to keep applying pressure. Keep applying pressure. Keep applying pressure. 
Okay. Is he in a house or are you outside of a house? Say again? Are you inside or outside? We're outside on the corner of Heather and Cuthbert. Across yep, from the Shamrock right. Deli. Okay. Just tell him to keep applying pressure, okay? If it becomes soaked in blood, add more to what's already there. What is your name, sir? Do you know the person or no? No, I don't. We just pulled over. Oh, my God. Okay. All right. Is he, is he blinking? That guy wearing a, driving an orange bike and wearing a hoodie. He's shorter than you. Uh, I hear them there. Are they there? Yeah, yeah. They're pulling up now. Hurry up. No, no, no. Okay, they're here. All right. Thank you. Let them take over, okay? Other 911 calls were also made, with some thinking the 57-year-old victim had been hit by a car. Shortly after the incident, authorities arrived and took Pastore to Cooper University Hospital, where he died from the 11 stab wounds. The victim's wife only wants to focus on the memories of a loving husband and father of five children. This has shattered us, but I mean, I'm going to choose to focus on my husband. I don't want to focus on the bad. That, that, that part is horrible enough, and I have to live with that for the rest of my life. Two days later, Williams was arrested and charged with murder and weapons offenses after police found his fingerprints on the tip jar and connected them to the job applications in the store. Employees kept the deli open and running, besides for the night that a vigil was held. They said that Pastore would have given the accused more than $20 that was in the tip jar had he asked. The vigil was filled with community members and loved ones, shocked at what had happened. One of his twin daughters, Rachel Guerrero, said, Of course we're angry, hurting. This was senseless. The violence doesn't make any sense to us, but I know my dad was protecting his workers, protecting their living. He really valued the people who worked here for him. He loved to be with his family, and we were really looking forward to him being pop-pop to our children. Jerry Pastore spent four decades in the restaurant industry. His family said after years of working as a trained chef, owned restaurants, and in sales, he bought the Shamrock Deli nearly two years before his death. The outcome of Williams's case has not been determined. On November 2nd, 2016, 34-year-old Sherry Papini left for a jog from her Redding, California home. When she didn't come back home, her husband Keith called 911. Hello, can I help you? Hello? Yeah, um, so uh, I just got home from work and uh, my wife wasn't there, which is unusual, and my kids should have been there by now from like daycare. So I was like, oh, maybe she went on a walk. Um, I couldn't find her, so I called the, the daycare to see what time she picked up the kids. The kids were never picked up. So I got freaked out, so I hit, like, the Find My iPhone app thing. And it said that her, it showed her phone, like, at our end of our driveway. We don't have really good service. Okay. Um, not the end of our driveway, but the end of our street. But so just drove down there, and I saw her phone with her headphones because she started running again. And it's, her, I found her phone, and it's got, like, hair ripped out of it, like, in the headphones. So I'm, like, totally freaking out, thinking, like, somebody, okay, like, what's just your... grabbed her. Okay, what's your address? Okay. Did you go pick up your children? No, I'm going to call my mom and have her do it. Okay. What's your wife's name? I'm going to, like, knock on every door. Uh, Sherry. S-H-E-R-R-I. And same last name? Yes. Is her vehicle there? Does she not have a vehicle? She has a vehicle that's at the house. Okay, the vehicle yeah, is at the house? She's running. How? Okay. Yes, I'm How? in it right now driving, and I took a picture of her phone on the ground before I picked it up. Okay. Do you know what she was wearing? Is there no something she always wears? I'm assuming she went running, so okay, probably there's... wearing athletic type clothes. Okay, there's not an outfit she always wears or anything like that. Does she run with a dog or by herself? By herself. Okay. At what but time were the kids? She just started running again, and we live in a. Well, when's the last sorry, time? When, when's the last time you heard from her? Uh, she sent me a text asking me if I was coming home for lunch. At what and time was that? Um. Uh. Uh. Well, give me one second. She sent me at 10.47 asking me if I was coming home from lunch from work. And I said, sorry, long day. And that was the last. Never spoke to her on the phone, never any other contact. Okay, and what time are the kids supposed to be picked up? Way before 5.30. She usually goes to like 4.45. Okay. 4.30, 4.45. 
Okay, are you headed back to the house or where are you at right now? I'm at the end of the driveway where, uh, I'm at the Old Oregon Trail and Sunrise where they meet because that's right where I found her phone on the ground. you telling me that something happened to her is the way I'm looking at it. There's like, then there was hair like in the headphones. Like it got ripped off of like the ground. Yeah, no, I, un- I understand. I understand. Okay, I'm sorry. I know it's you're okay. going to keep me calm, RC. <laughs> what kind of vehicle are you in? I'm in a black Kia Optima. Oh my god. Okay. And I live, I mean, we live down kind of a sketchy street, so I'm yeah. definitely, I don't know if I'm allowed to knock on everybody's door, but I will if I'm allowed to do that. Well, let's just have the officers contact you so they can start, you know, processing everything, figure out what's going on, okay? <sighs> And I understand you're freaking out a little bit. We want to we want to make sure we get your kids, mm-hmm. make sure they're okay. Obviously, yeah, I'm gonna call my mom stuck. and have her. Yeah, they've been stuck at this with your phone number. Yes. Do you want me to wait right here for somebody? Or? If you want to head back to your residence, so they can contact you there, and in case she does return. Okay. Okay. We'll have them contact okay. you at your residence. Call us back if anything changes. All right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Bye. Bye. When Keith Papini returned home after work at Best Buy and couldn't find his wife, he became concerned. She also hadn't picked up their two children from daycare. Keith eventually used the Find My iPhone application to locate her cell phone and earbuds at the intersection of Sunrise Drive and Old Oregon Trail. Many residents participated in a massive law enforcement operation searching Shasta County's trails, roads, and waterways for any sign of the missing mother. The case quickly attracted national news, and nearly $50,000 was raised to a funding page to help with search efforts. Michigan authorities executed more than 12 search warrants, and the FBI assisted in the case. Miraculously, Sherry reappeared three weeks later on Thanksgiving Day, November 24th. She said she had been freed by her captors at 4.30 that morning. The 34-year-old was found on the side of County Road 17, about 150 miles south of where she disappeared. Sherry was still wearing restraints. Her relieved husband, Keith, spoke to ABC shortly after she was found. And I get the phone and, oh my God, honey, and of course she's screaming, it's very emotional, and uh, I love you, I love you, I love you, oh my God, you're, you're here, you're back, where are you? According to Shasta County Sheriff Tom Bosenko, Papini said she was held by two Hispanic women who took steps to keep their faces hidden from her, either by wearing masks or by keeping Papini's head covered. The mother of two was branded on her right shoulder. The details of what the brand includes have not been revealed. And Keith said Sherry was physically abused during her captivity, had her nose broken and hair cut off, and weighed 87 pounds when she was released. Authorities continued looking for a dark-colored SUV with two Hispanic females armed with a handgun. The sheriff indicated there was sensitive information not being released at that time. Detectives had authored close to 20 search warrants and said they were examining cell phone records, bank accounts, email, and social media profiles. Sherry's husband wasn't ruled out as a suspect, despite being cooperative and passing a polygraph that he volunteered to do. Losenko said they were keeping an open mind and looking at all avenues, but Keith had reportedly compromised the investigation with his statements to the media after Sherry was found. Both male and female DNA were found on the woman, neither of which matched her or her husband. The FBI ran the samples through the Combined DNA Index System, or CODIS, and found no matches. For five years, the case went quiet. Then, on March 3, 2022, the mother of two was arrested on charges of making false statements to federal law enforcement officers and mail fraud. According to the DOJ, the entire abduction story had been fabricated. Sherry had allegedly harmed herself to give credence to her false narrative. Despite being advised that lying to a federal agent was a crime, the alleged kidnapping victim maintained her story when questioned in August 2020. Also, in March 2022, it was reported that DNA found on her clothing matched that of an ex-boyfriend, James Reyes, who confirmed that Sherry stayed with him during the time she was allegedly kidnapped. Reyes told investigators that he went along with the request because he had been told that Keith was abusing Sherry. Six days later, she was released from jail before her trial on a $120,000 bond and after surrendering her passport. Sherry and her lawyer had no comment on the allegations against her. 
The charges included lying to the FBI and defrauding federal, state, and local governments out of more than $150,000, the cost of the search. These could land the woman in prison for 25 years. However, six weeks after her arrest, Sherry signed a plea deal admitting that she had orchestrated the hoax. Sherry Papini was due to be sentenced on July 11, 2022, but her attorney asked the judge to postpone judgment and sentencing until September 19. Keith has since filed for divorce from the fraudster and hopes to get full custody of their children. In July 2009, a man at Sheboygan Convenience Store put his van in reverse by accident and crashed through the store, killing an 18-year-old clerk. His wife, Nicole Fister, dialed 911 for help as 18-year-old clerk Emily Hughes was pinned under the van's rear. Okay. Oh my God. Okay, calm down. If anybody's able to get out, make sure. It's not working. It's not working. My babies are in there. I, oh my God, I'm so scared. And I go around the side. I can't. My husband's in the van. Okay. And he put it in reverse. And it wouldn't stop. It wouldn't. I saw him. Let me call him. Oh my God, I need my aunt. Can I please call my aunt? Yeah. No, I need you to stay on the line with me. You need yes, to I'm on, on the, the phone, phone with you, honey. I'm on the phone. My babies are in yeah. the van. Okay. Okay, is the, is the van in park? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Can oh somebody my God, check on the, can three somebody check are in the van? There. Okay, is somebody able to check on the on the girl underneath the van? No, nobody can get to her. Nobody can get to her at all? No, I don't okay. know if she's not crying, nothing. Oh my God. You don't hear anything? My husband didn't do this one person. Where exactly in relation to the pig stop are you? Which side? The cop's there. The cop is there. You see the officers? I want you to wave yes, them down. Yes, okay? I'm going to get them. Okay. Wave them down. Okay. What's your name? What's okay. your name? My husband. Okay, my wait. name is Nicole. Nicole Hello. what? My babies are in there. My everybody. Oh, my God. Okay. Oh, it was totally an accident. I, I saw a break. Okay. Oh, my God. Okay. Can you please do me a favor? Are you there, ma'am? Is the officer no. there? Yeah, they are. Can I go, please? Okay, I'm going to let you go. Love you. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> Emily Hughes was killed in a tragic accident in Wisconsin where 32-year-old Jeremy Fister reversed his 2008 Chrysler Grand Caravan into the pig stop on the 2900 block of North 15th Street. The van had three children inside, reportedly crashed through the wall. Hughes was struck and pinned under the rear bumper in rubble. The accused reportedly picked up his wife, Nicole, who had gone into the pig stop store to pay for yes. After being extricated, she was immediately taken to the Memorial Hospital in Sheboygan. She was then transferred to Froad Turt Hospital in Wauwatosa, where she died a short while later. The cause was ruled as a homicide. Fister had reportedly initially told detectives that the brakes on his 2008 minivan were responsible for sending his van through the store's wall. However, Fister later came clean and confessed that he had just moved his child to the back seat before he got into the van's passenger side and tried to operate it by using his left foot to operate the gas and brake pedal. Jeremy Fister pled no contest to homicide by negligent use of a vehicle and reckless driving a year later and was sentenced to three months in prison. In Painesville, Ohio, Michael Craig appeared in front of a court for deliberately crashing his SUV into several cars and gas pumps. Okay, so there's been an accident on 20 or on fairgrounds or in your parking lot? It's, it's on 20. It's a very cost. There's a fire at the gas station as well. Uh -huh. We have a fire. Um, the truck, there's a truck that is burning. Okay, ma'am. Your building's on fire. Stop. Your building's on fire or the vehicle's on fire? The vehicle's on fire right next to the pump. We are all like... And then there's another car that went off into the side that drove out and hit the green... Um, there's a green fence over there. They went over there. This is really bad. There's a lot of smoke, ma'am. Please hurry. All right. They're on their way out, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Mm, bye bye. Bye. 911 to the location of your emergency. Hi. This, uh, we have an emergency at Gecko in Painesville. There's a fire at the gas station. It's going up pretty good. In the line, don't hang up. Can I have your name? It's at the pump. Bailey Lampy. Well, a car came. Uh, what pump you said? Correct. 
I, I have no idea. It's probably one of the middle. It's one of the middle pumps at the get go station at Giant Eagle on Fairgrounds Road and Twenty. It looks like they're the putting it out, but no. yes, the car is on fire. Somebody ran their car into a truck at the pump. Hang on one minute for me. Don't hang up. Okay. It looks like they're getting it, but yeah. Jesus. So the vehicle ran into another vehicle? Yeah, the vehicle ran into a truck, and yeah, I don't know where the other vehicle is. It's, it's still on fire, so. Okay, we have the fire. Oh, God. It's smashed out. Okay, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. 911, state emergency. Yes, we need a fire truck um, in gas station, gas station in Painesville. Okay. Get go. The get go. Fire on the truck. The truck on fire? Yes. Okay. By the pump. By the pump. All right, we'll get somebody right over there. All right, thank you. Bye. 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 I want to see the emergency. Uh, yeah, there was a uh, car just went off the road of like Giant Eagle and Pain Zone. Hit a bunch of cars, one's on fire. Okay. The gas pump. Um, near the gas pumps? Right next to the gas pump. And he's <laughs> off the side of the road. I don't know if anybody saw him or not. Okay, we're getting people heading that way right now, all right? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Bye. 911, take the location of your emergency. Got go. Okay, is it the one in Painesville Township? Uh, yes, right by the gas station. The okay. gas station. There's a car about to explode at the gas station. Okay, is the building itself on fire or just the vehicle? No, it's the pump star. It's um, like pump huge. on fire. Okay. Hurry up! There's a lot of people. Okay, we've got the fire department on the way. Tell me your name. Alex. And give me your phone number. Okay. I hit the emergency shut off on the pump, but this car is going to blow up. Okay, get everyone away from the area. Okay. Okay. We've got the fire department on the way. Okay. 911. Oh, hi. Um, I want to report a car on fire at gas station. Yeah, get go on Manor Avenue. Get go on Manor Avenue. Yep, you got it. Uh. Yep, we're on the way. All right, thank you. You're welcome. 911, what's the emergency? Yeah, I'm on Route 20 in Painesville. Yeah. Can you have a get go there by the yeah. Eagle? Yeah. Somebody ran a car right through that intersection, right through the parking lot across the street, ran over the fence. And, mm -hmm. sure and they went into the gas pump there, and that was on fire? Is it on, I don't know. Yeah, you, you, you went across the street. You went clear across Route 20 and, went, and ended up in the, uh, in the, his okay. car is in the parking lot across Route 20 and okay. across the street. They're already on their way out for it, sir. Thank you. Okay, yep. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. According to police records, Craig was driving a black Buick Rainier SUV that had been stationary in the get-go parking lot before accelerating at a high rate of speed and intentionally ramming into a gas pump. The gas pump dislodged from the ground. While pushing the dislodged pump, the 60-year-old struck a Ford pickup truck fueling at another pump. The Ford burst into flames. Two adults and a child inside the truck managed to escape safely. According to the sheriff's office, Craig continued across the parking lot in the SUV in the northeast direction toward Mentor Avenue. He hit another vehicle before entering the road. As he entered the road, he hit another car traveling eastbound. He kept driving before slamming into a fence and catching his vehicle on fire. When he was approached by bystanders trying to offer assistance, Craig allegedly told them he had a gun and would shoot and kill everyone. He then pointed what appeared to be a gun at Lake County Sheriff deputies before being taken into custody after a brief standoff. The accused was taken to TriPoint Medical Center for cuts and burns to his leg. He was medically cleared and taken to the Lake County Jail. Craig was indicted on three counts of first-degree felony aggravated arson, four counts of second-degree felony felonious assault, two counts of fourth-degree felony arson, two counts of fourth-degree felony vandalism, and one count of fourth-degree felony inducing panic. He was also indicted on misdemeanor charges of resisting arrest, reckless operation, and aggravated menacing. He was sentenced to a minimum of 22 years and a maximum of 27 years in prison. The next collection of calls play a part in a homicide case that has captured the world's attention. A man driving in the city of Moab, Utah, saw a young couple in a domestic dispute. When the male hit the female, 
The concerned citizen dialed 911. It was August 12, 2021. Although he didn't know it at the time, the Good Samaritan had just seen two people the whole country would soon be looking for, Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie. Grand County Sheriff's Office. Were you able to get a description of the Hi, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi, uh, I'm calling. I'm right on the corner of Main Street by Moonflower, and we're driving by, and I'd like to report a domestic dispute to Florida with a white van, Florida license plate, white land, gentleman, Where's it five, at? six beard. They just drove off. They're going down Main Street. They made a uh, a right onto Main Street from Moonflower. Or what were they doing? But um, what do you say? What were they doing? Uh, we drove by and the gentleman was slapping the girl. Who was slapping her? Yes. And then we stopped. They ran up and down the sidewalk. He proceeded to hit her, hopped in the car, and they drove off. Okay, you said uh, it's a white van. White van. I give you the. I give you the license plate. Just give me one sec. I took okay. a picture of it. What kind of white van? Like a big one? Um, it, it was a smaller van with the license plate of, it was white, Florida license plate QFP G03. It was, the make was a Ford model with transit, black ladder on the passenger side. The black ladder, uh, passenger Ford. side. White Ford Transit. White Ford Transit. Okay, what's your name? And where did they, so they turned... They headed south on Main Street from Moonflower Market? Correct. They made the right turn. Oh, so they went north. North. Yeah, sorry, I'm not from around here. Okay, are you, so you're right there by the post office? Right across the street, yep. Okay, and, and when they turned onto Main Street, they went right or left? Right. Right, so they went north. North on Main. All right, I will let somebody know. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Bye. Thanks. At 4.45 p.m., an officer stationed outside Arches National Park spotted the couple's white van driving erratically and pulled it over. As he approached the passenger side, he could see that 22-year-old Petito was in tears. When asked what was going on, she told him they had been fighting and apologized for distracting her boyfriend from driving. Through her tears, she continued to explain that it had been a stressful day and continued to shoulder the blame for Laundrie's behavior. When the officer then spoke to the 23-year-old, he also blamed Gabby. Noticing scratches on Laundrie's face and hands, police suggest they spend the night apart, which they did. An officer later described the incident as more of a mental health break than a domestic assault. The aspiring blogger was alone in Salt Lake City from August 17th through 23rd, while Brian returned to Florida to clear out a storage unit and pick up some items. During this time, Gabby uploaded her first and only video to her YouTube channel, Nomadic Static, on August 19th. The last time Joe Petito spoke to his daughter was on August 21st, when he ordered Uber Eats to be delivered to her. The day after Laundry got back to Utah following the storage unit trip, the travelers continued to the next destination. Petito FaceTimed her mom as they headed for Grand Teton Park in Wyoming. The last time Nicole Schmidt heard her daughter's voice was on August 24th. In September, a woman from New Orleans told Fox News that she and her boyfriend saw the couple when they were having lunch in a restaurant in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Between 1 and 2 p.m., Nina Salee Angelo noticed a man having an argument with restaurant staff. She wasn't able to hear, but the disagreement seemed to be about money, and the man's body language was clearly aggressive. The young woman with him was visibly upset. The distressed couple left, but the diners then witnessed the young woman return to Mary Piglet's and apologize for the man's behavior. When the witness realized the couple was Laundry and his missing girlfriend, she told Fox News that it gave her chills. Restaurant staff also identified the couple as Laundry and Petito. This was the last time anyone other than Laundry saw Gabby alive. The last post to Gabby's Instagram made some people speculate that she hadn't posted it. It was published two days after her last confirmed sighting, but it didn't include the location, unlike her other posts. Around 6 p.m. on August 27th, YouTuber and travel blogger Jen Bethune drove past Petito's van parked on the side of the road at a campground in the park. The van stood out to Bethune because of its Florida plates. Two days later, a woman announced on TikTok that she and her boyfriend encountered a man they believe was Laundry on August 29th. 
Miranda Baker, says Laundry approached their vehicle around 5.30 p.m. at Coulter Bay Village and offered them $200 for a ride. He claimed to have been hiking in Grand Teton for days while his fiancée worked on her website back at their van. The man hopped in the back of their Jeep, but then freaked out when he realized they were going to drive along the I-191 to Jackson Hole and got out. Another woman, Norma Jean Jalovic, said she picked him up from here and took him to the Spread Creek campsite. The following day, Gabby's mom got a text that appeared to be from Gabby, but she had referred to her grandmother as Stan, which was something she had never done before. Her mother's intuition told her something wasn't right, so she tried calling but got no answer. Her calls to her daughter's boyfriend also went unanswered. Around this time, Laundrie drove the Ford Transit back to his parents' house and arrived on September 1st, but he was alone, and he used his fiancée's bank card to fund the unscheduled trip. Petito's parents kept calling Gabby, Brian, and his parents for the next 10 days, but were met with nothing but silence. The Daily Mail uncovered two calls that were made to North Point Police on September 10th in connection to the laundry home. Police records note problems settled by both calls. It hasn't been confirmed that these calls were made by Gabby's family, but her mother had to make more than one call to report Gabby missing. Nicole Schmidt was first told that she needed to file the report in the missing person's last known location. On September 11, 2021, Nicole Schmidt reported her daughter missing in her home state, New York, and the media picked up the story. Police seized the van but left the laundry residence without seeing or speaking to the missing woman's boyfriend. Over the following week, the Petitos and the Schmidts continuously begged the Laundries for help in finding their child. At this point, Laundry hadn't been seen by anyone other than his parents and wasn't talking to the police. Then, on September 15th, he was named a person of interest in the case. Following this, Gabby's family wrote a letter to his parents, but this too went unanswered. The letter hasn't been publicly released. On September 17th, Chris and Roberta Laundrie told police they hadn't seen their son since September 14th when he allegedly went hiking in the Carlton Reserve. The 23-year-old was now a missing person of interest. The next day, Police searched for him in the Carlton Reserve while the FBI looked for his girlfriend in Grand Teton National Park. On Sunday the 19th, police made the harrowing discovery of the body of a young woman. Two days later, she was identified as Petito, and her death was classified as a homicide. The FBI searched the Laundrie family home the next day, and three days after that, a federal arrest warrant was issued for the missing hiker. However, Laundrie was still only wanted for using her bank card on his drive back to Florida, not her homicide. With the public already demanding answers from Chris and Roberta, Dog, the bounty hunter, showed up to their doorstep. 10 to 14, the female Roberta from that 1020 called it on 911. Uh, what's that? The address of the call, 4343. Yep. Whenever 10 or I was laying on, what was that traffic? We just have the female from that 1020 call in on 911, reference the situation with the male. All right, 10 Yeah, it's um, once you arrive or if you're already there and the occupants are requesting us to come up and just go ahead and go to the house and assist and just to keep the peace, but they're not requesting us to come up and just stay back and make sure that uh, everything's good. 10 he's clear. All right, 10 then. Main subject has already cleared the scene. The reality TV star opened his own anonymous tip line and told Laundrie's parents he wanted to bring their kid home, alive. On the weekend, public memorial services for Petito were held in New York and Florida. At the service in Long Island, New York, her family shared memories of Gabby and celebrated her love of life with the many people whose lives she touched. In Florida, around 200 came together in a candlelit vigil. The Laundry's attorney released a statement on Monday, September 27th, saying the parents didn't know where their son was. Petito's parents expressed further gratitude to everyone who helped and announced the start of a foundation in their daughter's name on Tuesday, September 28th. In honor of Gabby, who was a talented artist, they each had gotten the tattoo she designed and had on her arm. Out of nowhere, a 911 call was made from North Carolina by a hiker who said she was 99.99% sure that she encountered laundry on the Appalachian Trail. Hey, we're County 911. What's the location of your emergency? Um, well, I'm, I'm on the highway right now, but um, I, I ran into Brian Lauer just a little while ago. Okay, where did you see him at? 
Um, I was I was at the parking lot for the Appalachian Trail on the north side of Great Smokes Neck. Okay, can you tell me, like, was you at an overlook? Are you there? Hello? Are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, yeah, you're probably going through the gorge. You lose service every now and then. So where did you yeah. see him at? On Waterville Road. Okay, and just on Waterville, or did you see him near a house? Could you see a mailbox? He was he was driving a truck, and I stopped and spoke to talk to him. Okay. Was he going up Waterville or back towards Forty? He was going away from Forty. Okay. What color truck? It was a white truck. I think it was a Ford F-150. I'm not 100% sure of that. And it was kind of a, a newer model. It wasn't like an old beater. It was a, a newer truck. Okay. And what makes you say that it was him? Well, he was, first off, I was, I was ter making a U-turn and in the road and he came up behind me and he slowed down and kind of flashed his lights like telling me oh go ahead and go and i'm gonna wait for you and as i turned around and i'm coming back by him he's waving his arm out of out of his truck like for me to slow down mm -hmm. and i pull up next to him i'm getting ready to go through the tunnel here hold on one second okay can you still can you still hear me yeah yeah so when I stopped and I, I, I was, I think I lost you. And I was, he was, he was talking wild. He told, he said that his girlfriend loved him and he had to go out to California to see her. And he was asking me how to get to California. And I said, well, you can get on I-40 right there and drive West and you'll get there. And he said, no, I think I can go this way and kind of left, but he was acting funny. And I wasn't sure about what he looked like. And then I got, I went and parked and pull, pulled up the photographs of him. And I'm 99.99% .99 sure that was him. After reporting the sighting, the hiker shared his disappointment in the FBI for not following up on his lead. In an interview with ABC News, the fugitive sister, Cassie, spoke to the public on October 5th. She claimed to have no idea what had happened because her parents had also been ignoring her calls. The older sibling urged her parents to come clean if involved and told her missing brother to come forward. On the same day, there was news from the laundries. Their attorney texted WFLA News to tell them that his clients believed they last saw their son a day earlier than they previously reported. On the night of October 11th, the laundries were filmed removing white laundry baskets from their yard. Members of the public had left the baskets as a message for them to air their dirty laundry and reveal what they knew. On October 12th, it was announced that 22-year-old Gabby had been strangled to death. Gabby Petito's parents made the journey no parent should ever have to take and traveled to Wyoming on October 19th to collect their daughter's body. By now, Landry had been missing for a month. On October 20th, Chris and Roberta Landry led police to an area inside the Carlton Reserve near Mayakachi Creek. They had been inside the park less than 30 minutes when Mr. Landry left the path and, according to their attorney, stumbled upon his son's bag. Shortly after, police discovered bones and a human skull next to a backpack and notebook. The area where the remains and belongings were found had already been searched, but some parts had been underwater. On October 21, 2021, the remains were positively identified as the missing fugitive via dental records. At the time of the making of this video, Landry's cause of death is still unknown. The next call was received on October 27, 2008, and is from a mother who's frantically asking for help to find her seven-year-old son, JJ. Thankfully, JJ returns at the end of the call, but the mom's story doesn't end there. Just three months after this call, she was catapulted into the spotlight when she gave birth to the first known surviving set of octuplets. Nine one one emergency. Help 
me. I was fine. Help me. My son is missing. Okay. I'm going crazy. What I'm address are you at? Okay, you're going to have to calm down. What address are you at? Where's my son? Where's my son? Where's my son? Where's my son? What's your address? Where's my son? 13604 Sunrise Red Whittier, help me. Please help me. Have you seen um no, no. How old is he? He's five. Oh my god, where's my son? What color shirt is he wearing? Black shirt, moss. What Please color don't help me. Oh god, oh god. What color pants? What color pants, ma'am? I don't know. What's I don't know. Where's JJ? His name's JJ? JJ, please help me. Please help me. What's his name? Joshua Jacob. Help me. Please How long has it been since you've seen him? About half an hour ago. About an hour ago. An hour ago, he was... Oh. And I, Where was he an hour ago? An hour ago, I don't know. He's gone. Please, God, help me. Oh, God, please help me. Please, this isn't happening. And what's your name? Company. JJ, I, 13604 Sunrise Drive in Whittier. Ma'am, what's your name? Nadia, N-A-2. God, help me. Okay. Please. Where was he the last time you saw him? An hour ago. I know, but where was he? Ma'am, where was he? <laughs> He was out front. Oh my gosh! I'm gonna die! I'm gonna die! Oh God, help me! God, help me! Oh God, help me! God, help me! This isn't happening! This isn't happening! God, help me! Okay, are your neighbors helping you look for him? Yeah, they don't see him anywhere. Oh, okay. Where's JJ? Did you go in the house to see if he went in the house to hide or to He's nowhere. He's nowhere. He's nowhere in the back. He's nowhere in the house. God help me. Where's JJ? Where's my baby? And he has brown hair? He has a sandy brown hair. JJ, JJ, where's JJ, baby? Where's JJ? Where's JJ? Who are you asking? Oh, my baby. Okay, who are you asking? Does he have a little a brother or something? He has a, a yeah, 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 brothers and one and two sisters. How old's his brother? God, God, help me, too. Two. I'm losing my mind. He's gone. He's never done this before. Was the two-year-old with him? No, no. He he had a black shirt on. So he was playing by himself in the front yard? Yeah. Uh, his older brother was there, too. How old's his seven. older brother? He's seven. Okay. He's seven. And did you okay. ask the older brother if you've seen him? Please, God, pray. I pray. He looked after him. Please, God, help me. Please, God, help me. Please, God, okay, help me. and you asked the older brother, right? Yes, I did. And that's your address, 13604. Yeah, please, God, help me. Please, God, help me. What if he, what if someone came in the car, or some stranger? Did I do? Oh, God, oh, God, I'm going to kill myself. Oh, God, I'm going to kill myself. Oh, God. I'm going to kill myself. Oh, God. I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to kill myself. Oh. Hey, don't say that in front of your other child, okay? Keep yourself under control for your other child. He doesn't need to hear that. Okay? Sure. Whoa. Let mommy go. He went on a walk. What? He went on a walk and he came back by himself. Okay, so he's back. Who's that? Who's that, mommy? So he wa he just walked back up to the house. When JJ went briefly missing, he already had five brothers and sisters. His mother, Nadia Sulman, said that when she called 911, she was hormonal and a little anxious. When she gave birth to octuplets in January 2009, she became known as Octomom. The eighth baby had been a surprise as only seven had been counted during her pregnancy. All of her 14 children had been conceived via IVF, which raised questions about the ethics of enabling such large pregnancies. 
The doctor who implanted Nadia Sulman's embryos had his medical license revoked in 2011. Once her brief fame ended, Nadia Sulman struggled to cover the costs of her huge family and made some interesting career moves. She starred in an adult movie, posed topless, worked as a stripper and took part in boxing matches with minor celebrities. In 2013, she applied for welfare benefits, but the following year she was charged with failing to report $30,000 of income when she had made that application. Nadia Suleiman pled no contest to the charges and was sentenced to 200 hours of community service, two years probation, and was ordered to pay a small fine. As of 2023, the octuplets have started eighth grade, and Nadia continues sharing her journey as a mother of 14 children on social media. A man at a migrant worker camp outside Sandusky, Ohio, shot his wife and stepdaughter with a shotgun in December 2008. The killer's nine-year-old son witnessed the shootings and ran to another house for help, where 911 was contacted several times by an 11-year-old. This is one of the calls. Karen County 911, where's your emergency? Yeah, it's 5181 the View Road. Uh-huh. Yeah, can you please hurry up? Okay, what's the guy's name? Nick Anor, N-I-C-A-N-O-R. And his last name's Garcia? Yeah, G-A-R-C-I-A-S. -A -S. No, wait, C-I-A. Okay. And Is your mom there? Yeah, because the... They're on their way, honey. What's your name? Hello? Hello? Okay, it's two, two ladies. And the husband have the... It's two ladies and what? Have a... They've been sh have they been shot? He's coming here now, please. It's a lot of time. He's but coming. He's coming. They're, on their he's coming. They're on their way. Can you please hurry up? Yeah. Are they... Are you guys safe? Yeah, we're safe. He's, the man... He's with, the, with his... Well, he shot his daughter and his wife, but... How do you know that he shot both of them? Because they're both bleeding and they're both crying. How did you see them? They're right now, the little boy came to our house and knocked on the door and said, go to our house. Okay, they're on, they're on their way. I'm just trying to get some information. So, a little boy came to your house and told you? Yeah, the little boy. Okay. All right. And is the guy drinking? I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. You need to stop crying, okay? We're on the way. And I have an ambulance on the way, too. Okay. Okay? Bye. Just make sure you stay inside and keep the doors locked. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, excuse me. Go ahead. We're in the house inside. The guys come down, but we're in the house helping them. You're in the house? Yeah, we're in them. Okay, where's the guy? In there. He's in there? Yeah, with them. With us, but he's all right. He's come down, but he just, uh, he's like helping them, but I don't know where he shot him. He shot one, and now he's helping her up? Yeah. He shot both of them, and now he's helping them. And now he's helping them? Yeah. Okay, and you can see that? It's so fast because they, they're bleeding a lot. They might, I don't know. Okay. He got a little... 56-year-old Eric Siren shot his 49-year-old wife, Jennifer, and his 21-year-old stepdaughter, Andrea Heiser, before turning the gun on himself. The murder-suicide occurred in their home in the 1300 block of Quinlan Court. Andrea was an undergraduate student at Wright State University, majoring in statistics. She was taken to Springfield Regional Medical Center, where she was pronounced dead. Her mother, Jennifer, was the chief financial officer for the Clark County Juvenile Court since 2011. Care flight took her to Miami Valley Hospital, where she died the following day. The Springfield New Sun employed the estranged husband and killer for several years. In 2012, he had been employed by the Chamber of Greater Springfield, where he worked until he died. He allegedly had a civil stalking protection order filed against him in 2002, but no other criminal history on his record. According to Jennifer's ex-husband and father of Andrea, Randy Heiser, his daughter could not get along with her stepfather because she would often stick up for her mother during arguments. 
Andrea was the oldest of his and Jennifer Siren's four daughters who moved in with an aunt after the shooting, never wanting to return to the home again. Andrea was described by her father as outgoing, loved everybody, and as somebody you wanted to be around, almost too perfect. Heiser's other daughters were reportedly in the home. The youngest allegedly saw the whole thing. According to Heiser, his youngest daughter witnessed Eric laughing maniacally as he shot Jennifer dead. On November 12, 2008, teachers arriving at Snipes Academy noticed a young man lying on the grass outside their elementary school. When they took a closer look, it was obvious that he was dead. Just before 7 a.m., with parents soon to arrive and school buses full of children already on their way, the principal dialed 911. Communications this morning. This is Allison Ward, the principal at Snipes Academy. We have a dead body right out in front of our school in the grass area, but we're at the John B. Dorothy B. Johnson location. What is the address, ma'am? 1100 McCray Street. 1100 McCray, and is the person out there? Yeah, the, my custodian just took out the. It's a young boy, looks like a young man, and he's done in the body stiff. But it's right out, like it's right across, we have a little grassy area right across from the school, you know, we're on that strange little. And are you, sure that, are you sure that he's in it? Well, he kicked him and he's stiff. He didn't move. He appears to be in rigor. His, there's blood coming out of his nose. I mean, I'm not going to touch him, but okay. I'd say he's definitely dead. He, I, I didn't call the emergency number just because we're about that scared. Yeah, that's okay. Dead. How old does he appear to be? He looks like he's probably in his, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 18 to 22. Okay. Oh, we're right down from the Wilmington Police Department, so but we don't have a school resource. And you're at 1100 McCray? Yes. And you're the principal there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, just stay on the phone in one minute, okay? Yes, ma'am, no problem. We'll go ahead and get some help started over there. Okay, we're going to need the medical examiner or whatever, I guess. Do we not have something else that... Is he a black or white male? Can you tell? He's an African-American male. So that... We're covering the body so that if we have kids come, is that okay? Hang on a second. Let's make sure we're allowed to and touch him. And he has blood coming from where? Don't touch him. We don't touch him. When he, he has blood coming from where? coming out of his um, right nostril that kind of ran down his nose. Okay, yeah. Don't touch him. Okay, don't touch him. So, can we do two and stuff? I don't know how we're going to... And you say he's stiff? Yes, ma'am. He's definitely stiff. So, I'm going to on the phone and call Marie Barnhill and see if we can stop buses up, like maybe up by the boys and girls. Because until we get this covered, we do not want children getting on this campus. And exactly where we're at at the school is the... Yes, we're at, when you come out of our front entrance, there's McCray Street or Swan Street, whatever it's this goofy kind of street that comes around by the Boys and Girls Club. Mm -hmm. He's right on the patch of grass across from where we park and where families drop their kids off and that kind of thing. Okay, will it be somebody there to meet the, the paramedics and the officer? Yes, ma'am. We're standing right at you right now because we're going to try to figure out how to keep kids from coming on campus until we can at least get this scene secured so they're not looking at this. Okay, and um, is, I can tell you how to do CPR. Do you think it's... No, ma'am. We definitely be on CPR and, we'll, and we have several of us standing here trained first responders but he is not... Okay. Holy cow. <laughs> Did anybody see what happened? I was. was no, ma'am. We just. Uh, I came in the dark this morning. I was here at mm, 515, 520, and I pulled in so the grounds were dark, so I didn't see anything. My head custodian came in at about 6 or 7. Did you see him? Mm -hmm. So my, my assistant principal just drove in, you know, and she said there's somebody sleeping out across from school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sarah. We have to wait till the on the comes to the scene. I don't know. It looks like something came out of the nose. I'm on the with the police. You know what we may need some help is if Paige is trying to call buses is just maybe stop parent traffic. But I don't think we should let kids or anybody on here so we have this cordoned off. Okay. That was probably not an SRS on yet. Yeah, maybe we can take a lot of cars. That's a good idea. 
we got to get the paramedics in here first. Okay, and I'll, I'll notify the SROs so and maybe they can get over there and help you out. That would be great. Um, De Deputy McMillan is at Virgo, and Deputy Curry is ours, and I know Sergeant Caesar shares quite frequently. Okay, and you're at Snipes Academy, right? That's in the name of the school, but we're at the Dorothy B. Johnson site. Okay, but it's 1100 McCray Street? Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay, I have everybody on the way over there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let you go. Just keep everybody away from him, yes, away from the area as much as possible. Okay. So if they, they need to investigate um, the surrounding area, just don't let anybody keep going up to him and walking around that area. Okay, great. And, um, and they should be there shortly. Okay, thank and, you. Okay, if anything changes before they get there, just call us back. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. School buses were diverted to a nearby middle school, and parents were sent home before they could turn into the school where the body lay. Given the age of the victim and the location of his body, Wilmington police immediately treated the young man's death as a homicide. An examination later revealed the cause of death to be a single gunshot wound to the back of the head. Aguana Walker was one of the parents who had driven to the school and was turned away by police. Unable to drop her six-year-old daughter at school, but grateful they hadn't seen the body, Aquana called her boss, who suggested she pray for the dead man. In a shocking turn of events, the homicide victim was identified as her 19-year-old son, Darian Terrell Walker, just hours after she arrived home. Amazingly, Darian's killer was already communicating with police and had even told him about the murder. New Jersey Bloods gang member Jaquela Shansa Banks had been arrested that same morning after she held up a nearby restaurant. The 19-year-old was also the prime suspect in an attempted murder that happened a month earlier. On October 16, 2009, Banks had sold heroin to 18-year-old Edward Boot, but had shot him in the neck as she tried to steal the drugs back. The bullet lodged in his jaw, and he was lucky to escape with his life. However, when police asked what had happened, the victim refused to say who shot him. The gang member had approached Darian the day before, but rather than sell him drugs as she had implied, she stole his iPhone. Darian worked for a local restaurant and wasn't known to have any involvement in drugs. Those that knew him struggled to understand why anyone would want to end his life. His funeral was held on November 19th at Miracle Temple Ministries Church, and he was buried in the Walker Family Cemetery in Burga. Jaquela Banks was charged with first-degree murder and robbery with a dangerous weapon and held at the new Hanover County Jail on $2 million bond. She avoided a trial and possible life sentence by taking a plea and was sentenced to 14 to 18 years. Darian's parents showed incredible strength by not only facing their son's killer but also forgiving her. Darian's mother said she prayed for the murderer and said God loves her despite what she's done. In September 2009, the convicted murderer pleaded guilty to charges surrounding firearms and organized crime. For this, she was sentenced to 10 years, which she's currently serving alongside her murder sentence. In June 2015, Isaiah Vizi told a 911 dispatcher in a scattered call that he had stabbed his great aunt to death in her home. He refers to himself as Abdul Aziz. When officers arrived at the Edisto Drive home around 9 a.m., they found the 25-year-old on the porch and still on the phone with dispatchers. Orange Park County 911. Hi, this is the Emergency Call Relay Center for Time Warner Cable Void Phone. Transferring a 911 caller from 2117 Old Edisto Drive in Orangeburg. Uh-huh. Give the caller's name and phone number. It's Abdullah Aziz. How do you spell that? I'm assuming A B D U L L A H A Z I Z. A Z I Z? Mm hmm. Phone number 803. Time Warner Cable. Okay. And just to warn you, he's, he's notified me that he's murdered his great aunt and she's dead on the floor, so I'll bring him on the line. All right. Sure, go ahead. Hello. Hello? Yeah. What's going on? Um, I, I murdered my great aunt. Oh, I'm on uh, 2117 Old Edison Drive. 2117 Old Edison Drive? 2117 Old Edison Drive. Okay, hold on one second. Uh, hello? Okay, what's your name? My name is Adul Aziz. Okay, uh, I didn't speak with you before, so um, down a notch. What did you, what did you say? Okay, I didn't speak with you before, so I don't know this information. What exactly is going on, sir? How old are you? I'm uh, 27. You're 27? 
I'm 27 years old. Okay, what exactly is going on? My great aunt is dead. I murdered her. She's on the floor. She on the floor. She gone. Okay, uh, and, and how exactly did you do this? Uh, I used the knife. The knife is inside the kitchen, and it's sitting inside the the dish bowl. It's inside the sink. Okay, and where and where did uh -uh. you suppose? Where did you suppose? You said this is your aunt. My great aunt. Okay, so you stabbed your great aunt. Where did you stab her at? In her room. This in her morning. in the room. In her room. Yeah, we, we got to discuss it. Um, uh, sir, okay, you said it was your great aunt and you stabbed her in her room this morning? Yeah, about like... Where where on her did you stab her at? In her chest. In, in her, her chest? In, in her, her chest and her... In her heart. Okay, where did you stab her at? In her heart, toward the body. Like you said in her what? 20 times. No, okay, you stabbed her where? In the heart. In her heart. Okay. In her heart. And toward the uh, the abdomen, in the torso, in the torso. Okay. In her heart and in her back. Her her front, the, the her chest cavity, her heart, and her stomach. Chest, stomach, and what else? Um. And you said in the I mean, back? That's all. Okay, and you said how many times? I mean, in her arm. She was in, she kept trying, she, she moved her hand. Okay, and how many times? About like, about 20 times. More okay, less. and why And why did you do this? Yeah, I seen you, Why did you do, I speak English, why did you I do know, it? I know, I'm going to say it again. Yeah, I see, yeah, see. Okay, speak of the English. I don't understand what you're yeah, saying. I just say Arabic, Baba. I'm not about to say no more than that. You didn't even okay, say no more right, than what's, what's uh -uh. I'm sitting on the porch. I got a red cap on. And I got a, a, a red shirt on. Uh, okay, I got on wait, light sir, sir, and sir. Black tennis shoes. I sir, got shades on. Sir, we yeah. have the officer on the way or what have you. All right, Baba. Is it, you. What? Is it a house or a trailer? That was going on out here in these streets. You know what I'm saying? Young brothers can't get supplication. Sisters can't find a brother that don't, you know what I'm saying, that don't want, he don't want to toil the land no more. You know what I'm saying? Everybody sitting on their ass. United States is looking so bad and slum. The trade market down Galilee look worse than ever. Nobody heard about Injetti. You know what I'm talking about? It's horrifying. It's scaring me. And I'm a doula Z. And I don't like it. And I'm about to sit on the porch so I won't, I don't want to look. Let me turn this radio off. Stuff out here. I mean, it's it's wrong. You know what I'm saying? Ain't nobody out here. I'm from Washington D.C. I'm from Jetty. I do the trade down Galilee. You know what I mean? Yeah, I see. Yeah, see. You know what I'm saying? I come through with all this spirit, right? Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, and everybody learn. Fake bishops at the church, fake bishops up the street. You know what I'm saying? We got all these illegal aliens in our land. I'm like, I ain't got nothing against no Hispanic. I ain't got nothing against no black, white, Puerto Rican. What the fuck is y'all doing? I'm a young from the rural environment of Washington, D.C., over Southeast. And if I can make it educationally, you know what I'm saying? Why the fuck can't young shawty do it? Oh, young shawty do it. Where the men at? Where the ladies at? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Where the masons at? I'm not out here in the street. This is doing nothing with their time. It's up. Are you listening? I'm letting you. I'm listening to what you're saying. I know, I know, I know, I know. But, I mean, it's messed up. I mean, what What else was I supposed to do? I can't receive supplication. You know what I'm saying? Supplication. They got, they got people. They got people doing all sorts of mischief, right? You know what I'm saying? Everybody do good and evil, but... What did your aunt I mean, do? when is it going to be time to reap what you sow in these streets? Uh, Abdul. You know what, what, what did no, your great aunt do? Right. You know what I'm saying? It's not right. Okay, what did your great aunt do, though? You said, what she what? What did she do to deserve to be stabbed? I mean, what did she not do? I mean, I'm a brother from Washington, D.C., traveled all the way down to South Carolina. I can't get no breakfast in the morning. Huh? I can't get no, I can't get you to go into the storehouse and get the gold and silver out, huh? The crew oil, huh? I can't get you to get the loaves out, the fish out, you know what I mean? 
You know what I'm saying? Take your ass up the street like you've been doing every day. I ask you, do you know what the storehouse is? you like 75. I'm like, come on. How come you saying you don't know what a storehouse is? You bring your sisters over. You poison the food every day. I've been down here for a year, and I ain't said nothing. She poisoned my food. But I'm already sitting on Miyagi. You know what I mean? So why the You know what I'm saying? And it's, I'm at the house where the office is at right now. You at the house where the office is at? Yeah. I'm on the porch. Okay, well, what you wear so I can make sure they um at the right spot. They at the house right now. They got the the black and the white out. They yin yang. They, I mean, I'm here. You know what I'm talking about? All right, well, I might have just. I'm... Okay, you're gonna you're gonna go ahead and tell them what you told me. Hello. In addition to VZ telling the dispatcher he stabbed his great aunt, Della Reese Dash, he confessed to deputies while he was being read his Miranda rights. He said he had stabbed her about an hour before he made the 911 call. According to investigators, the 74-year-old's body was wrapped in bedsheets in her bedroom. The victim's son says VZ moved in eight months before the stabbing, and for six months, they were telling her to kick him out. Another family member said although VZ has a mental illness, he knew what he was doing. Dash's neighbors described the elderly lady as nice and spunky, saying she kept to herself. One of them, Tasha Ford, didn't expect her to have any enemies because she would do anything for anyone. Ford's five-year-old son, TJ, was struggling to come to terms with her sudden death. To date, the events of the seemingly senseless killing are still unclear, as is the motive. VZ was charged with murder, but the outcome of the case has not been published. In October 2019, Angeliana Estorf called 911 to report someone broke into their house and shot her husband, Brenton. The family was asleep in their Texas home when the invasion happened. Before we can now, do you need to start? Help me, please, all. Someone just broke in my house and shot my husband. Somebody broke in your house and shot your husband? Hold on, ma'am. What's the address? Glenn Rosa Drive, Katy, Texas, seven seven four nine four. Okay. I don't know what to do. Okay, with listen to me. I'm gonna give you some instructions. Okay, is your is your husband is your husband breathing? I don't know. I'm so scared to walk over there. They shot him. Okay, hold on. I'm so scared. I'm so sorry. I don't know what to do. No, nope, it's fine. Hold on. Oh my God! I think he's really hurt. Baby, are you okay? Baby, are you okay? Can I call my neighbor? Is there anything I can do? Please? Give me, give me a phone number so we, I can have my call taker to uh. Seven one three. Hold on for me. Yes. Give me phone. Call this number right here. And I'm you want sorry, to, I have two kids in the house. Send her, send her neighbor over. Did this your neighbor across the street? Uh, yes, right next door. Have the neighbor next door to go to her house. Stay on the phone with me, ma'am. Okay. I really don't know what to do. Baby, baby, please. Are you... What's your name, ma'am? Angelina. Angelina. How long have you heard the cops are here? They on the way. I don't know what to do. Okay, I just don't know what to do. I'm so sorry. They on the way. They're on the way. Okay. 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 Okay, it's going straight to voicemail, Okay. Okay, okay, I'm I'm gonna ask you some questions, okay, Angelina. We got okay. EMS and police on the way. Okay. Is the person okay. that shot your husband is he still there? No, I don't think so. But I'm so scared. I can't walk over to my husband. Is your husband breathing? I don't know. I can't walk over there. He's making gurgling sounds. Okay, where was he shot at? In the chest, right in the chest, on the left side of the chest. I don't know what to do. Okay. 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 Uh, we, I need you to help me. Okay. Can you get to your husband? I can, but the door, the, the window is broken, and I'm scared that they're still there. Okay. The window is broken. Yes. Where was Where was he at in the house? He He was like we were laying down in bed. We were asleep. Okay. 
I'm just, I'm freaking out really bad right now. And I'm trying to get the, the number to my neighbor. Yeah, because it's just ringing. So do you have another name, number? No, um, I'm calling you from my husband's phone. I'm calling you from my husband's phone. How long before the call? There, we got several units on the way, sweetie. I just need you to ask, answer these questions, okay? And you cannot get to your husband at all? I can, but the window is broken, and I don't want to walk okay. over there. Okay, can you lay on the out. ground and get to him? <laughs> we have nothing but back windows. <laughs> okay, did they break in or did they shoot through the window or? I don't know. I okay. just heard glass shattering and then my husband jumped up and took off after him and they, they just okay. <laughs> started shooting. How many people? Are, how many people are in your house right now? I two adults, me and my husband. Two adults, and two, kids. two adults and two kids. Yes, and I'm calling my husband right now. I mean, I'm calling my neighbors because I just need help. I need help. I need help so bad. <laughs> okay, where are your kids at right now? One is in the room with me, and the other one is in their bedroom. Okay. <laughs> she's trying to get to him, but she's scared to get to him. I'm trying to get her to get over there. <laughs> The father of two was shot dead after fighting the intruders in Katy, Texas. In doing so, he saved his family from harm. Brenton was shot on the left side of the chest and although a neighbor had tried to resuscitate him, he could not be saved. Police report that the intruders left the home with nothing, leaving questions surrounding whether or not the shooting was planned. The 29-year-old Australian had first come to the States to play basketball and then returned to play football for Southern Virginia University, where he met Angeliana. The couple soon fell in love. In an interview with Seven News, she recalled meeting Brenton through their brothers, saying they knew almost instantly that they would get married and spend the rest of their lives together. In the same interview, the heartbroken widow described the evening of the murder. He reportedly heard a window smashing and got out of bed to investigate while his wife and two children slept. Brenton then fought off the attackers. Angeliana also spoke about their trauma, how the kids will have to now grow up without a father, and appealed to anyone with information that could lead her family to answers and their beloved Brenton's killer's justice. The victim's father, Mike Estorff, said, he was the one that fought off the intruders, important for him in life, and that's what he protected. He spoke to Nine News soon after the tragic murder. In a Facebook post, his brother, Corbin, despite a $25,000 reward put up for information leading to the capture of the intruders, no arrests have been made to date, appealing to the public to send any information they may have. Police spokesperson Jessica Reyes said officers were investigating a car that reportedly sped away from the scene. Additionally, there are mixed reports about the widow seeing the intruders. Neighbors in the area were startled by the incident, telling news stations that it is normal for them to leave their doors unlocked. A GoFundMe page was set up for the family, where loved ones share fond memories and loving messages about Brenton. The most recent public update from the family was posted by Michael Lestorff, reads, To all our friends and relatives on the 16th October is coming around. One year on that day, we lost our wonderful son and Ange lost her love of her life. His two children are without a father. We would like people that brought one of these shirts to wear it on the 16th of October as a remembrance to Brendan. At 3.03 p.m. Queensland time to have a toast and chug a beer. We would also like to thank our friends, others, and relatives for their continued support. Justice for Brenton. In June 2015, 51-year-old Michael Rode called 911 to report that he had just killed his 72-year-old wife, Sandra Rode. The Traverse man was incredibly polite to the dispatcher, but what he said was shocking. After the call, Rode waited inside the couple's Tradewinds Terrace apartment until his arrest. 911, what's your emergency? Hey, ma'am? Yes? Uh, yeah, uh, What's going on? I just killed my wife. You just killed your wife? Yes, ma'am. What happened exactly? Oh, what happened? Uh, 
I, I was on the phone, you know, the man, you know, and the guy said you had to pay four hundred dollars, and she said she did, and, and she lied, you know, uh, ma'am. Yes. And then she, you know, this crap, you know, and then she turned around and pushed me and shoved me, you know. What uh, happened to her? What did you do to her? Okay, I, I, I had a frying pan, you know, ma'am. I'm listening. I had a fry, I had a frying pan, and then I. And then I went, and I got a knife. I did. Did you stab her? Yes, I did, ma'am. Okay. I want to check and see how she's doing, okay? How old is your wife? Uh, I think she's dead, ma'am. Okay. Well, we're going to go through this anyways, just in case we can help her. How old is she? 57 years old. 57? No, no 70-something years old. 77. Is she awake? Let me see if Sandy's awake. She's not? Uh-huh. Is she breathing? No, I know she's not. Okay. What apartment are you in? Apartment 13. Okay. We're going to try to help her out, okay? All right. All right. Thank you. No, stay on the phone with me, okay? Okay, sure. I just have to check. Is there an AED available? What's that mean? It's a defibrillator. Oh, no, ma'am. Okay. Are you right by her now? No, I'm in the living room. Okay. Can you go near her? If there's any chance of helping her, we're going to help her, okay? Okay. All right. I want you to make sure she's flat on her back on the floor and remove any pillows. Uh, yeah, she's on her back. Okay. I want you to lean over her, put your ear over her mouth, and listen to feel for any breathing. Let me know if there's any. Oh, hold on. I can't tell, ma'am. You can't tell? No. Okay. I want you to listen to me carefully. I'm going to tell you how to do chest compressions. Okay. Place the heel of your hand on the breastbone in the center of the chest, right between okay. the nipples. Okay. Put your other hand on top of that hand. Okay. Do you understand me so far? Yeah. I want you to pump the chest hard and fast at least twice per second. Uh, hold on. I did, ma'am. Hello? Yes. I did. Okay. I want you to keep pumping her chest. We're going to do this 600 times or until help can take over. Okay. Hold on. Are you doing compressions? Are you doing compressions, sir? Can you hear me, sir? Hello? Yeah, ma'am? Yes. N nothing. Okay. I want you to keep going, okay? Okay. I want you to keep doing it until they get there. Can you put the phone on speakerphone so I can still talk to you? Hold on. I don't, I don't know how to work this at all. Okay, that's fine. What's your name, sir? Huh? What's your name? My name is Mike, ma'am. Okay, Mike, I want you to keep doing compressions until help arrives, okay? Okay. Where's the knife at? By me. Okay, I need you to put it away from you. Okay. Okay. Where'd you put the knife? According to the accused, the couple had gotten into an argument over an unpaid $400 bill. Apparently, they had received a call about an unpaid bill that Sandra had lied about already paying. The police report states that she had been choked, struck with a frying pan three to four times, and then stabbed to the heart four times. Rode confessed to the police that he had chosen to be honest about his actions. Prior to calling 911, he had left his parents a voicemail informing them that he had killed his wife. A manager at the apartment complex told the police that a few weeks prior to the murder, the couple had seemed agitated when coming in to pay rent. The manager also said that Rode had told her that he had a feeling she was mixing up his pills and giving him pills to make him sleep all the time. She had suggested to him that he speak to his parents about the matter. Rode was charged with open murder and three counts of assault. In November 2015 and in October 2016, Rode was deemed incompetent to stand trial and would remain at the state's forensic psychiatric center downstate. According to County Prosecutor Bob Cooney, charges will likely be dropped as they can only try and make a person competent for 15 months. Should Road be found competent later, then Cooney would get notice 30 days prior to any sort of release and can then refile charges as well as have Road retested for competency. The family seemed to be grappling with their loss alone. According to a Facebook post on ATTN by Sandra's niece, Amanda Silvercrow, in June 2015, the family have not received any return calls or support from prosecution or local law enforcement despite their efforts to make contact. The post reads in part, My aunt, 72-year-old Sandra Rode, was murdered on June 6th. When your family member is murdered, you would think. At the very least, an officer or a person from the prosecutor's office 
somebody would at least hand you a 1-800 number or a pamphlet. Something. Sandy Rhodes family has not received one return call, or any call for that matter, from the prosecutor's office since her murder. It has fast become obvious we are only survivors, and based on the lack of empathy and the careless disrespect demonstrated, it is quite clear. She also spoke out against hurtful comments on local media sites, calling them flippantly hurtful and cruelly judgmental. As it stands, there have been no further charges or updates about Michael Road. Peoria resident Yvette Gibbons initially thought her husband was snoring until she realized he was having a heart attack. She then made this call to 911 in May 2017. I need you to I think take it. A heart attack. Okay, I need you to take a deep breath. Okay, I understand this okay. is scary, but I need you to take a deep breath so you can help me help him. Okay. Oh my God, he's trying to breathe. Okay, is he not breathing at all? No, he's not breathing okay. at all. Then stop screaming. Pull him flat on the ground right now. He's on. He's on flat on the bed right now. Okay, pull him onto the ground. I can't. He's so big. Okay, I need you to try use the sheets, anything that you can use to help him pull him off. <laughs> okay. Oh my God. Okay, like telling him to breathe is not going to help. Pull him off the bed. Okay, please. Oh, God. How old is he? Nicholas, Nick! How old? How old is he? He's three years old. Okay, is there anyone else there with you? He's on the ground. Okay, listen to me. Okay, I know you're scared. Is there someone there with you? My son, okay. Purple. Okay. What I need you to do is put one hand in the center of his chest and place your other one on top. You're gonna interlock your fingers, okay? okay You're gonna I'm lock your it. elbows. Okay. Put one hand in the center of his chest. Place Wait, the other one on top. Okay. Okay. You're gonna interlock your fingers and you're gonna lock your elbows and push down as hard as you can. Okay. It's gonna go fast and it's gonna be tiring. Okay. But that means you're doing it right. Okay. So you're gonna go at this speed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you're gonna keep doing this until we get there. Okay. Okay. So every t every ten I push, right? No, nope. You're gonna push every time I count. One, two, okay, go. three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Okay, I need you to count out loud so I can hear that you're doing okay, it. Ready? Right. Go ahead. Okay, ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Perfect. Keep going. One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Keep going. Keep I'm going to stay eight. with you. Okay, keep going. Okay. Ready? He just took a breath. Keep One, doing it. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay? Okay, you getting tired is a good sign. Keep going. Don't stop. Now, hold on, baby. Just stay by the door. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Stay out there, baby. They're going to be here in a minute. And how old is your son? He's 16. Okay, have him wait at the front door so he can direct them straight to you, okay? Seven, eight, nine, ten. At least he's getting air inside of him. That's good. You're doing okay, a good job. Okay, he's by the door. Okay, keep going. Are you going back, baby? Is he snoring? One, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He's not sorry. He's just breathing. I think his tongue might be back there. Hold on. Okay, you can he's read it. Okay, what you can Pardon do me? is take his chin and tilt it towards the ceiling, okay? You're going to put one hand okay. under his chin and place one on his forehead and tilt it towards the ceiling. See if that helps. Okay. He's, he's uh, sitting a little bit. One, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, you're doing great. They're almost outside your house. Okay. Okay, they're just pulling up outside. They're going to get some equipment. Keep going until they tell you to stop. <laughs> they're upstairs, too. they got to rush upstairs. Okay. Your son's down there, correct? Yeah, he's down there. Okay, keep going until they tell you to move. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Baby, stay there. Baby, stay with me. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How old is he? Forty-eight. Forty-eight, okay. Hey, stay with me. Keep breathing, baby. Keep going, keep going. Two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Baby, stay here. You are doing a great job. Keep going. I know it's tiring. Okay, baby. 
Hey, they hurry? Eight, nine, ten. They're here in a second, baby. They're going to be right here for you. He's not really responding to me, but he's breathing at least. Okay, keep going. If he doesn't push you off, keep Three, going. Four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hey, baby. Okay, see you. Hi, guys. Okay. Okay, they're here. Okay, you did a great uh. job. Incredibly, she was able to revive her husband, who was treated by medics soon after. A few months later, the couple was able to meet the emergency dispatcher they say saved the man's life. City of Phoenix Fire Dispatcher Laura Thomas said the call from Yvette was her last call for the day. Her quick thinking of guiding the woman through CPR meant that he began breathing again. Thomas was ecstatic to meet Yvette's husband, saying they don't often hear what happens after the call. ABC 15 captured the emotional reunion. You don't get more Australian than this next call. 72-year-old Heather was mowing her lawn when she saw a dark-colored snake weave through the grass. Snakes are perhaps one of the most feared animals in the world, and Australia definitely has more than its fair share of deadly serpents. But no snake was going to send Heather running from her garden Instead of fleeing, as you might expect, Heather went after the snake. I spotted the town of the emergency. I need to ask the question first. Okay, well, I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to send an ambulance just yet. Okay, tell me exactly what's happened. Well, I've been out mowing and I have disturbed the snake in the, in the garden. Mm -hmm. I've got two spots on my leg and they're about an inch apart. Would that be a snake bite? Well, potentially. Um, I think that probably will err on the side of caution. Um, did you feel it happen? Um, and no, I didn't even see the snake until it, 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 it uh, moved and, and I run over it and then I look down and I can see that I've got two two punch marks. I haven't got scratches or anything. Sometimes they strike that quickly, you don't even feel it. Um, and it's just, it sounds like it might be a snake bite. Don't panic, okay? You seem I'm not sitting down at the moment. No, I'm seeing you. Okay, try and stay as, as still and calm as possible, and it's going to be hard sometimes. How old are you, my dear? Um, 72. I'm yeah, 73 next month, okay. okay. Did you see what kind of snake it was? No, it's, uh, it's munched up. I don't know if it's black or a brown one. It's 18 or 20 inches long. Did it was all munched up? Did it go through the mower? I put it through the mower. Oh, I didn't good work. Back at me. <laughs> it's bloody thing. First time I've seen snakes in, in my garden. Well, I'm organising help for you now. Just stay on the line. I'll tell you exactly what to do next. I want you to keep from moving around, so stay nice and still. And um, where's the bite? On your lower leg? Yes. Okay. So keep that limb down. Yes. So have you got a bandage there that you can use? Oh, no, I haven't got a bandage, but I've got two of one of those um, things you put around your head when you're doing your makeup. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, like head down things. Um, have you got any tea towels or towels or anything um, in, in your reach? So I'll go get some. Yep. Okay. Wrap the limb from the area of the bite down to your foot, then back up the the body um, snugly enough to get one finger to slip between the bandage and the skin. So it's quite a lot of bandaging. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Um, like I said, you're keeping wonderfully calm. I love that. I just hope they don't laugh at me and say, so they're not, not going to laugh at you. You're taking the appropriate precautions, and that's the most important thing. It must have been under one of those drains, I think. You didn't enjoy it when I saw it. Oh, gosh. I, <laughs> I didn't scream. I just got the um, limo, and I just give it one big push right across it and chuck it off. I'm one good snake, but I'm not one good snake, and that's a big one. Yeah, I hate them. <laughs> Anyway, there. All right, okay. Heather, I'm going to leave you with the paramedics, okay? Don't feel silly. All the very best. The retiree usually hired someone to mow her lawn, but that day she had asked him to tend to her friend's garden as the friend's husband had recently passed away. After Heather had killed the snake, it was identified as a venomous red-bellied black snake. Its venom contains a concoction of toxins which in extreme cases can cause necrosis that requires amputation, but there have been no recorded deaths from red-bellied black snakes. Luckily, no venom was injected when Heather was bitten, and she was released from the hospital after 24 hours of repeated blood tests and close observation. Catherine, the operator who took the call, was impressed with Heather's ability to stay so calm and called her a badass grandma. Still, one neighbor wasn't so impressed and accused her of upsetting the ecosystem. 
Heather didn't feel any symptoms from the bite, such as sickness, but she did say that she felt a bit stupid. U.S. Marine Corps veteran Roy Link planned a fishing trip in February, but something told him to join the search for missing two-year-old Joshua J.J. Rowland. And the little boy's family will be eternally grateful that he did. 911, what's the address you're Hey, I found him. You found him? Uh, hey, where are you at? Oh, mommy. Uh, I'm walking over here to a field. An open field. Uh, okay. Uh, mommy. Um, oh, mommy. Okay. I know what's um, okay, buddy. One moment, stay in oh, line with me. Uh, okay. What is your name? What's your phone number for you? And you said you're in a field? Excuse me? He said he, that you're in a field? Oh, uh, yes, I'm walking out to it now. This guy might have a... Yeah, I found him. Yeah, I'm on there with 911. You know where we're at? How is he doing? Is he... Right next to where? Okay, we're next to Powell Middle School. Next to, next to the road in this field. All right, how is he doing? He's good. He's doing good? Okay. Yeah, he's alive as well. Yeah, we're giving him some water and he's wanting mama. Okay. No. No. Here, let's walk up to the road. Yeah. We got him here. Good job, buddy. Hey, just stay on the line with me, okay? We're trying to get yeah. okay. out to you. Yeah. here last night? No. No? Uh, your mommy. Your mommy's coming. Can you hey, stay where you're at just so we can get units to you? Okay, sure. Yeah, so yeah, just stay where you are. Just you stay on the line with me. Excuse me. Yeah, he's on the phone now. Excuse me. Hello, ma'am. Hello. I'm still here. Yes. Um, we're if we're walking toward Cobb Road. We're behind. We're beside the school, Parrot Middle School. Okay. So you're walking toward Cobb by the middle school. We're walking toward Cobb in the big field right beside Parrot Middle School. They'll know where it's at. Yes, sir. We just give him some water and okay. he's a little, a little panicked. I give him some water. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. I figured this is where he was going to be because mm -hmm. this is the area right behind his house. Okay. Yeah, they're coming. They're coming right here. Hey, they want us to walk out here to Cobb. They want us to walk to Cobb right there. You want us to take him on to Cobb? We can take him faster. All right, yeah. No, but I can drive when I can't drive him. Sorry, we can just walk in the shade up here. That way he don't get... We don't want him to get panicked. I get in the shade. You still there, sir? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, How many people are there with you? Oh, uh, about 15. And how far away from... How about are you? Uh, probably 100 yards. Okay. Yes, yeah. 100 yards. Yep, we're probably 100 yards from the highway. Uh, we can see the... They're going to uh, put him in a side-by-side. -side. Oh, he don't want to get in it. Never mind, he don't want to okay. get in it. He's too scared of it, I figured. Yeah, that's okay. Just keep him with you. Yes. Yeah, we got plenty of people here. He's good. They're giving him a little bit of candy right now and giving him some drinks. And okay. He's, I'm sure he's starved. Yeah. But yes, sir. He's good. Oh, yeah, he keep me on the line and call a deputy is there with you. Okay. All right. Okay. Yep. Yep. It was good to have all the boots on the ground to find him. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Are you guys still walking towards Cobb? Yes. Okay. Just we are right know. now. Just let me know when you actually get on Cobb, okay? Yeah, it's going to be a little bit because we're, like I said, we're 100 yards, 150 yards probably. Yeah, that's okay. Do you have anyone else that can, like, go out to Cobb and just to uh, meet our unit there and start leading Hang them on. back? Hey, they, to hey, they want to know, could you run up there and flag them down? Yeah, she's going up there on the side-by-side -side right now to flag them down. Okay. Yeah, the big orange side-by-side. -side. big orange one? Yeah, big orange and black side-by-side. -side. They can't miss it. Okay. There'll be a gate right there, but it's it's closed and locked, but... But they'll be able to see. Good job, buddy. Way to make it. Way to make it. Such a big guy you are. He got some scratches and scrapes and bruises, but over 24 hours alone in the woods. 
Yeah, he did great. Yeah, he did great. There they are right there. There they are. Yeah. Okay, you see a unit? Yeah, here they are. They're here. Yeah, they're here. Okay. okay. I will let you go and right, talk you. to them. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The toddler had wandered away from his Hernando County home on the morning of Thursday, 23 February, while his mother was asleep. An hour after she noticed he was gone, she contacted the sheriff's office. A missing child alert was issued the same day. The next morning, volunteers, law enforcement officials, and the U.S. Marshals started the search before 6 a.m. Around 24 hours after J.J. had disappeared, Roy Link heard whimpering in the bushes. That's when he made the discovery. I came up on some woods and uh, I listened good. I heard like a whimpering kind of noise. At that point, I was like, there's no other kids here. It's got to be J.J. Sure enough, I went in the woods and about 100 feet from where I was at, he was, I think he was in some stickers. There's a lot of stickers and all there. The miracle even made Sheriff Ninhuis emotional. I got to admit, I'm a little emotional because yeah, uh, I thought sure we were going to have bad news. And it is, uh, it is a good day in Hernando County. Roy was honored by the department for his heroism. If I'm a hero, then everybody is. You know, uh, everybody was there. Everybody was searching. Perhaps the most heartwarming part of the evening Roy met J.J.'s father for the first time. He was just overwhelmed. He said his whole family is, and we said that we would meet in the upcoming days. He's going to give me a call so me and J.J. can catch back up and, and go from there. In November 2015, nine-year-old Lily Barber called 999 after her mother, Claire, collapsed at the wheel of their car on a busy Greater Lanchester Road. Lily and her younger sister guided the police to their whereabouts. With you okay? Can you okay. Can you speak to her and get her to talk to you? She, uh, she's completely passed out. She can't walls. talk. She just noticed she's just going. Hoo, hoo, right, hoo, okay. hoo. I should not be mental like, stress illnesses. She did really hard. Yeah. She, she, she's she's blinking. She just blinks. Wigan, you've come from Wigan, aren't you? Yeah, and I'm, yeah. Um, I'm in between on the way to Booth Town and Ashley Industrial Estate. You're near Ashley Industrial Estate? Yeah, I think we're right next to it, I'm not sure. Right. I'm not very good with most ways. How old are you, Willie? I'm nine years nine. of age. I know CPR, but I'm not very good at it. No, that's fine. As long as she's breathing, okay. She is breathing. She's yeah. all like slab in her mouth. Do you think you're do you think you're on the east flanks? So have you got an off the motorway? Uh yeah. Uh, no, we're not off the motorway. I think I'm on the east flanks, yeah. Do you think you're on the east flanks? Yeah. Just coming off the east flanks, I think. Right, okay. And you're near Booth Town, you said, yeah. Yeah, near Booth Town and it says pointing an arrow, so we're right. We're like I think we're like um a few, about a mile away from Ashley Industrial Estate, I'm not sure. Right, okay. There's a sign in front of me saying, Booth Town forward ahead, it's a quarter of a mile away, and Ashley Industrial Estate, quarter of a mile away. Right, okay, that was a second. My mum, 
She's alive. She's alive. Right. Mother of two, 41-year-old Claire Barber had been visiting her boyfriend with her children and, upon driving home, pulled over to the side of East Lancashire Road with a headache just before collapsing. Luckily for Claire, her two daughters, nine-year-old Lily and six-year-old Eva, were in the car with her and the older of the two hurried to contact emergency services. The schoolgirl had been stressed and highly emotional but calmed quickly once the dispatcher started talking to her. Lily desperately tried to explain to authorities that they were in a Fiat 500 and close to an industrial estate on the side of a busy two-lane road. She also put on the vehicle's hazard lights to make it easier for them to be found. Both sisters have been awarded for bravery by the police, and their mother expressed how proud she was of her daughters, saying that she had taught them about 999 emergency services from a young age and stressed how important it is for children to be aware of what to do in an emergency. For more True 911 calls, watch this episode next.